I think this outreach idea is a very good one. I think uh, earlier in the morning, we actually had a business meeting among all the Academy members, and I can tell you based on what uh, uh, the President uh, shared with us that there is wonderful new initiatives underway to promote engineering in the developing world uh, for the purposes of the good of society in some very, very interesting ways that were illustrated today. And I think he may well tell you about that. But let me tell you just a bit about him. Dan Moet is, uh, is the president of the Academy, of uh, the National Academy of Engineering. And uh, Dan was uh, previously uh, the president of the University of Maryland, where he had a distinguished career in leading a, one of the finest institutions. But his roots go back to California, where his PhD and his bachelor's degrees all come from the University of California, Berkeley, a fine institution which we compete regularly, I might add. Uh, but he is a mechanical engineer by training. Uh, he spent his life in engineering. He and I had a short conversation earlier in the day, and we talked about how important uh, scholarship and research is, even in the part of administrators, and uh, how hard he worked to continue his life as a as a research scholar through much of his professional career, very successful. He's produced 58 PhD students. That's an extraordinary accomplishment for anyone. To do that when you're an administrator as well is unheard of. And I must say, we must take our hat off to him in so many ways. But more than that, we want to welcome him to our institution. We're honored to have you here, Dan, and we'd like to offer you a chance to say a few words. Oh, Byron, thank you very much. I think that was a that was really a, a very a splendid introduction. My mother would be very proud of me for that. That was really great. I, I think uh, it's actually my um, privilege to thank Purdue and Byron, who is the chairman of this program, and, and Leah Jamison, who, who uh, agreed to host this regional conference um, most generously. Th these are very important conferences for the Academy. We have a few of these each year. Uh, and, and as Byron said, it's a way of bringing some of the academy interests uh, out to the public and, and, and actually brings the academy members of the region together also uh, in this conference. So it's a, very, uh, it's a very fine opportunity. I've never seen an academy program, a regional academy program put together better than this. I think this is, you should all be very proud of uh, Purdue and your leadership of putting this program together. It's a very splendid uh, program, and I think it reflects uh, engineering and the academy extremely well. I really can't thank you enough for doing this. L let me just say a couple of things about the academy. As, as Byron said, it's a Washington, D.C. based operation. And we used to say, uh, people say, well, where is it in Washington, you know? And we'd say, used to say, well, it's near the Lincoln Memorial between the Lincoln Memorial and the State Department. Now, we, we don't actually say that anymore. We now say it's, the, it's right behind the Einstein statue. That's, where, that's how you define it. Because everybody knows the Einstein statue. They don't know Lincoln Memorial anymore. They know the Einstein statue. So when you're in Washington, right behind the Einstein statue is where it is, and between the Lincoln Memorial and the State Department. And so uh, please uh, feel free t to come there. Um, you know, the Academy's got to about 2,000 members, and it's, uh, this is its uh, 50th anniversary. And it was created, uh, the complex was cre created uh, by Abraham Lincoln, actually, the whole idea in, in 1863, 150 years ago. Um, and, and Lincoln created the academies so that they would give advice to government. That's the purpose of the academies. In fact, he wanted them to be independent, not funded by government. And they wanted, he wanted them to be experts, so they had something to say that was worth listening to. And he wanted, he wanted them to be uh, essentially created to fulfill that purpose, and that was originally the National Academy of Sciences. And then under that charter was created the National Academy of Engineering, actually 50 years ago, so the, the NAS is 150 years old. The National Research Council was created 100 years ago in 1916. But basically, this independent advice to government. So the academies are advisory bodies. They don't actually, they don't, they don't actually make things. They don't actually do engineering in the real sense. They do studies to advise other people government principally, but now others, including ourselves, uh, on what, what needs to be done. So um, 
the, the, um, this is the 50th anniversary of the Academy. This is the 50th birthday, and there are a lot of things that we're doing about this birthday that are reflecting on the value proposition for engineering. We're really, really emphasizing this. Basically, engineering uh, creates solutions for the welfare of humanity and the needs of society. The four key words for engineering are create, solutions, humanity, society. That's what engineering is about. All engineering fits, is, discovered by, is created by that, that description, and that's what engineers do. And um, en engineering is different than science. Science is, uh, of course, uh, wonderful. Uh, it basically is about discovery and understanding. Engineering is about creation and solutions. Engineering has been around a lot longer than science, by the way. Engineering has been around for as long as humanity, because humanity's always created things. So a lot of people do engineering and don't call themselves engineers. Uh, <clears throat> that's one of the confusions. We, we normally think engineers do engineering, scientists do science, inventors do inventions, innovators do innovations. <clears throat> but 20, over 25% of the members of the Academy, National Academy of Engineering, have no degrees in engineering. In fact, some have no degrees at all, as a matter of fact. In fact, you don't get elected by what degrees you have. You get elected by what you do. <laughs> And what you do if you do creating solutions for humanity and society, you qualify to be a member of the National Academy of Engineering. It's not the National Academy of Engineers. The distinction is very significant. So it's a very great uh, privilege to be here. And I I'm very much looking forward to this program. And I th once again thank Byron and I thank everybody for putting this program together for us. Thank you, Dan, very much. That's a uh, that's very eloquent uh, way of saying uh, what our Engineering Academy is about. And uh, the next person I, I want to introduce is an, uh, very much a manifestation of, of the engineer and the engineering profession of today. Um, this is Leah Jamison, our dean here at uh, Purdue. She is the John Edwardson Dean of Engineering. Uh, she also holds a distinguished professorship here in electrical engineering. And um, I can tell you that no one uh, in the country, perhaps the world for that matter, has the education of engineers more at the heart of what she does and what she thinks about. And no one would doubt that. In fact, uh, she won the Gordon Prize for Innovation in Engineering and Technology Education um, and in fact was the inaugural winner of that award. Um, and we're delighted to say that, but, and to note that about her. But the exciting thing to me is that not only is she interested in the education of engineers, but she's also interested in the innovation of knowledge and the creation of knowledge and research that engineers so vitally need to uh, carry forth as we uh, practice our profession and develop it. She holds a uh, membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she is a fellow in the IEEE. For those of you who don't know what that is, it is the most important organization in our electrical engineering profession. As a matter of fact, uh, she spent some years, in fact, when I first met her, uh, she was beginning to serve as the president and CEO of that organization and uh, perhaps the only person who have ever accomplished being simultaneously the dean of Purdue while she was CEO of IEEE. That's an extraordinary accomplishment. She managed to, I think the word is, survive those years and grow into the, into the wonderful leader that she is to this College of Engineering here at Purdue, and we're delighted to give the floor to her at this time. Thank you, Byron, and, and I want to add my welcome to all of you as well. For, for those of you who are Purdue colleagues and students, um, thanks for being here today. Um, as you know, there, there is a lot of interest in manufacturing, which is the, the topic that is framing our discussions today. And for those of you who are visiting us from 
um, from, certainly from the National Academy, but also from surrounding universities, companies. I know we have some people here from Ohio and Michigan and, and certainly Indiana so, and Illinois. And so welcome and um, we're happy that you could come spend a little bit of time in West Lafayette, Indiana with us. I'm going to give a very brief talk for the, with the purpose of framing some of the questions both the opportunities and the questions around manufacturing. And you know, Byron talked about my um, work in, in education, my faculty home in electrical and computer engineering. And one of the things notably absent is that I am not a person who is steeped in manufacturing. On the other hand, I've had um, the good fortune for the past couple of years to be collaborating with some of my colleagues at Purdue, both faculty colleagues and, and other deans, um, to take stock of what's happening in the United States and in the world in the area of manufacturing and through that to be able to work on building very broad-based teams not only at Purdue but that are extending ac across both universities and industries um, in the state and to the state itself and so I've found myself now occasionally as, as in the position of being a spokesperson for manufacturing at Purdue and, and to some extent in the state and so I'm going to give you an overview of what Purdue is doing in terms of not the specific research, but in terms of how we're thinking about this space that we're in, the opportunity space of manufacturing, um, to elicit some of the, the big challenges and the, the approach that we are taking to create the partnerships to really be able to think about what manufacturing can look like going forward. And you'll notice that Indiana is in the title. We've grappled with this literally from the beginning of these discussions because manufacturing is not a state level topic. It is a national topic, it is a global topic, it's a regional topic. On the other hand, because there is absolutely a component of it that has to do with economic development, in a lot of states and certainly Indiana being one of them, there is also this, this desire to think about it in the context of the state and then to build outward from there. And so um, that is, is really what I'll be describing. So let me start by, um, th this is really the summary of where our discussion started a few years ago, that um, there is a very unusual, a, a, probably a once in a lifetime opportunity because there have been changes in the cost of energy, in the, the distribution and generation of energy, in economics in the country and in the world, in transportation costs and labor costs, that there is in fact renewed national interest in manufacturing. Um, this has manifested itself in initiatives such as the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership and most notably in the NNMI um, with significant federal investments in manufacturing after a, a long period of time when that simply wasn't the case. Um, and in the states, obviously, this continued discussion about what is the role of manufacturing, and in particular, what is next generation manufacturing, and what part of our economy is this going to play? And so the, the proposal, as it has played out at Purdue and across Indiana, has been to create a statewide center that is intended explicitly to have global reach at academic partnerships, Purdue, Ivy Tech is the statewide community college system, Vincennes Community College in southern Indiana. Collaboration with leading Indiana companies, um, Cummins, John Wall will be talking later today, and many other large companies, but also the small and medium size manufacturers in the, in the state. And so we have Craig Carson here from Jekko Plastics, for example, um, epitomizing the, the, the full range of manufacturing and the scale in which this is done in company side, but also with some support from the state. Um, partnering with global companies because it isn't just a statewide issue. And focus areas in technology transfer, research innovation, and workforce development. And so that is the shape that this INMAC has taken, that there are these overlapping sectors having to do with education and workforce development at being central to the future of manufacturing and the present of manufacturing. 
thinking about research as a foundation, especially for positioning with what's going to happen in the future, and then the very immediate opportunities for tech transfer and tech adoption. And so we've built this statewide center around these three principal areas, um, and I'm going to simply describe what those look like. In the case of education, workforce and education programming, initial partnerships supported with state funds, um, representing the universities, Purdue, West Lafayette, Ivy Tech, Vincennes, and one of the regional campuses of Purdue, um, ranging from orthopedic and advanced manufacturing, a training center at Ivy Tech, which is, by the way, the largest community, single community college system um, that there is, and it's, it's a relatively new thing in Indiana, but um, great potential. Vincennes focusing on workforce development broadly. Um, Purdue Calumet focusing on workforce needs in mechatronics um, based on hearing from a number of industries. And at Purdue West Lafayette, um, a leadership development program in advanced manufacturing. The second major thrust is in the area of tech adoption. How can we take the expertise that resides at the universities, <laughs> among its faculty, among its graduate students, and bring that to bear on specific problems and challenges being faced by companies? And here again, three areas of focus. First in digital engineering, project lifecycle management, and production systems and modeling. Um, we started counting in, in this effort last July when, when the, the fiscal year started. We, <clears throat> there are currently 13 companies under contract who are working with faculty and grad students for combining the university expertise with the company needs. Um, 22 of these in the pipeline. <clears throat> and simply a snapshot that, that, again, focusing in the state, these are spanning the entire state of Indiana. And finally, the research component, which has bearing on what is happening in manufacturing today, but most importantly, as we keep thinking about the research component, um, for leadership and defining and predicting and preparing for what is manufacturing going to look like in the future? And how does that research then going to inform the education and workforce development for the future, the, the capabilities for tech adoption, and how do you weave these three together? And in the areas of research, um, focusing on three directions, digital manufacturing, personalization, and market viable manufacturing processes. And this is playing out in the, in, um, the form first of what we're calling um, INMAC Fellows. These are graduate students who with their faculty have been identified to be um, working on cutting edge research problems and they're being supported for that. And the commitment from Purdue in this area, um, we are conducting a lot of faculty searches because engineering is growing at Purdue, but six of the faculty lines in fact are in manufacturing and those searches are underway. And they will be split among engineering, the College of Technology, and the Cranert School of Business and potentially computer science as well. So three thrusts. And so this is a model that we simply say, as we think about where manufacturing could be going, that these are three critical components. And you can piece them together in lots of different ways. Um, we think that having recognizing the overlap is important, but also recognizing that these three aspects of manufacturing are best addressed together, that thinking about this as a whole. There is one other way that I'll just close by saying there is another way of looking at this when we try to visualize what is this, um, the stakeholders in this picture. So the educational institutions clearly as, as a core stakeholder, industry, as something that um, is the really the, the engine of the economic development and the, the, where the manufacturing in its essence resides, but also the state as a, a key partner and stakeholder in this. And so if we integrate those together, we have something that really does cut across 
the, the factors that will lead to a successful, thriving next generation manufacturing effort, not only in Indiana, but in the region, in the country, um, but with, with a, a rich set of players to make that happen. And so I will close um, that as a framing and we'll move on, I think, to the, to the substance of the day. Okay. Thank you very much. I failed to mention that the theme of the speakers today is manufacturing. And uh, we will hear from a number of speakers, including one that's just come in the back door, and I'm delighted to see her, Anne-Marie Sastry, who will be speaking to you later about her activities here uh, in battery uh, synthesis and manufacturing. Now, all I have to do is find my agenda. <laughs> The uh, okay, what I do with it? Maybe I may I borrow agenda from someone. I've misplaced mine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, and it's very, I think, um, in many ways. Uh, appropriate that he be the first speaker. Um, I've been, as some of you may know, I've been at Purdue for 10 years now, in my first decade. This is the celebration of my first decade here. I do feel like a boiler maker, but I have to tell you, there is one person that uh, ranks way above me in terms of being a boiler maker, and he holds all his degrees from MIT. So, see, it's possible to be a boiler maker and not actually be a graduate of this institution. And so he and I share that. We're both boilermakers, and this is John Wall. John is a very special person. I've been watching him from afar, actually. I didn't actually uh, have time to spend time meeting John until today, though I have, he and I have shared letters of reference for a number of people for prizes and awards over the years that have been, uh, and some successful. And he's the chief technology officer at Cummins, Cummins is one of the most important uh, manufacturing industries in the state of Indiana, and we are delighted for the fact that if, there's, if there are creative things going on at Purdue uh, that relate to engineering, John is almost always right in the middle of it, and, uh, and, and we very much value his, his focus on us. As a matter of fact, when you see him stand at the podium, you'll notice that his tie is a Purdue tie with all of the Purdue logos, and there you outrank me. I didn't uh, do that today. Um, but he serves on a number of ad advisory councils for Purdue. Uh, he is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, as we all know. But he's also a fellow of the Society of Automotive Engineering, reflecting his commitment to that industry, especially to the propulsion side of it. Uh, he's received the SAE Horning Memorial Award and the ARC T. Caldwell Award a merit award for research in the area of diesel fuel effects on emissions. And he has the S ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineering, Sachiro Honda Medal for significant engineering contributions in the field of personal transportation. I think that uh, gives you the wonderful uh, capability that John has, his experience, and he will share with us some ideas today uh, about advanced product technologies in Indiana. I turn the floor now to John. Thanks, Brian. I, Dan, I think my mom would be equally proud and probably somewhat stunned if she had a chance to hear that. Um, so I'm very happy to be here today, uh, especially representing uh, an, uh, an industrial company in Indiana. I'm happy to be following uh, Leah and the partnership that we've had with Purdue over the years. I will say with pride that Columbus, Indiana has the highest per capita number of mechanical engineers of any, any city in the United States, and a lot of those are Purdue grads, so uh, we thank you for your contribution uh, on that front. Uh, the topic today is, uh, is manufacturing in Indiana. I'm going to focus some on uh, technologies from Indiana uh, that we have developed, uh, some for, some from, and some far from Indiana. We're, you may know that Cummins is the largest independent manufacturer of diesel engines uh, in the world. 
And a lot of that technology is uh, developed here. We spend about a billion dollars on research and engineering every year, and about half of that is spent and driven from the state of Indiana. Um, so to get on with it, I thought just to give you an idea of the scope of products we make, uh, the, the engines range from 55 to uh, 5,000 horsepower. Uh, the one on the right is uh, going to be made on a new manufacturing line in Seymour, Indiana. And if you're looking for a scale factor, if the, let's say, if the president of the National Academy of Engineering were standing between these <laughs> engines, that's about what it would look like. So I, I want to talk a bit about our products and specifically about how we have developed emissions technology over the course of the last few years. I appreciate it even more now, having spent last week enjoying the atmosphere in Beijing, China, and my voice is still uh, recovering from it, so hopefully it'll be good for another 30 minutes or so. Uh, but I'll talk a lot about low emissions, but we remind ourselves, and our marketing department reminds me frequently, that the EPA has never bought a single product from Cummins, and so we've got to be really clear that while we're meeting the emissions, uh, we also have to deliver products that have the qualities that our customers are looking for, good fuel economy, low cost, they're reliable, they're durable, uh, they give them the performance that they, uh, they care about, and so it really is very much a system integration problem uh, that allows us to meet the emissions and deliver products that are good for the environment while we're delivering products that are good for our customers. This is sort of where I, I, I thought I would ground it in, the, in where emissions control have come uh, in the U.S. I started in 1994, and you can see that uh, from then till, uh, till the current products that were the most recent standard implemented was in uh, 2010, we've had a very substantial reduction. If you back up another 10 years, the particulate levels were uh, 10 times as high as you see uh, with the first standard that went into place in 1994, and NOx was two times as high. If you want to know what I've been doing professionally for the last 30 years, this is sort of it in a nutshell. Uh, developing the emission control technologies and also fuel technologies that go hand in hand with enabling the engine designs. And so my good friend Joe Colucci and I have been working together for a long time on fuels and lubes and engine uh, integration. Uh, in order to be able to enable these uh, improvements in, in emissions control. So it's fully a 98, 99% reduction in particulate and in NOx emissions since we started regulating uh, commercial diesel engines back in the mid-1980s. Uh, Cummins also in, in manufacturing engines manufactures components. We're the only engine company that has all of the uh, critical components in-house. So turbochargers, fuel systems, filtration systems, exhaust after treatment, electronic controls, uh, and all of those come together for controlling the combustion event and also being able to control the chemical reactors that we have put in the exhaust now to, uh, to further control emissions from the engine. You cannot say the phrase system integration too often when you're talking about how we have to do our work and how we have to make these components play together and then how we have to integrate them not only into the vehicles that the engines are operating, but even into the business systems of the people that are uh, applying those products to do their work. <clears throat> I thought I would just talk through a bit uh, some of the critical steps in the emission control technology over time. I've shown them as a series of S-curves. You may be familiar with that, with the early adoption of technologies, the, the broader adoption and growth, and then finally uh, one technology sort of tails out as, uh, as the next one moves in. And so here are the, okay, hello, there you go. Um, here are the key steps uh, along the way. We, a lot of this started out really as how to control NOx emissions. NOx is uh, just made by thermal reaction. The air has nitrogen and oxygen in it. You heat it up, they react, they make NOx. Uh, and a combustion event, you can imagine, uh, gets pretty hot. And so a lot of what we've done in the early days uh, of trying to control NOx emissions in cylinder was how to uh, how to reduce the peak combustion temperatures while still preserving the efficiency of the combustion event. Uh, if you put air through a turbocharger, you compress it, it heats up, uh, and so you want to be able to cool that after you've compressed it uh, before it gets into combustion, and that's what the after-cooling step was about early on. The very first steps in NOx control was putting after-coolers on engines to cool the air before it went into the combustion event. Uh, in the mid-1990s, electronic fuel systems uh, came on board for heavy-duty uh, diesel engines, 
Uh, our first all-electric, we introduced them at Cummins in the early 1990s. Detroit Diesel actually went all-electric in, uh, in the early 1990s, and by the mid-90s, uh, everyone was there with electronic fuel systems. One of the things about these S-curves is that you really want to be on at the front end, not at the back end. Uh, because if you miss the curve, you don't make money selling the technology, and in fact, it may, uh, it may knock you out of business if it's, uh, if it's a big step that you've missed. So with electronic fuel systems, uh, after that, we'd pretty much gotten as far as we could with just cooling the intake air, and so we went with cooled exhaust gas recirculation, taking some of the exhaust, cooling it, reintroducing that into the combustion chamber, and it sort of acts like dead weight. You've got water, you've got CO2, uh, you cool it, the combustion energy has to not only heat up the air, but then has to heat up this extra cooled, relatively inert charge that's in there to further uh, reduce the peak temperatures during combustion. That required higher injection pressures. So over this period of time, we saw injection pressures that were moving up from on the order of 10,000 PSI to on the order of 35,000 PSI. There was a lot of manufacturing technology that went into the fuel systems in order to be to enable that. Materials development, uh, tolerances that are on the order of microns using ceramic components to uh, be more tolerant of some of the water that gets into the fuel uh, compared to steel uh, technology. In fact, if somebody, I've, sell, I've told our fuel system guys from time to time, if they came to me today with a design for a fuel injector uh, for a diesel engine with the tight tolerances, the materials, the size of the components that are that are in it that make it work. If I didn't already know it work, I would tell them you gotta be nuts. You're never gonna be able to make one of these things uh, function. But we make millions of them uh, a year now. Uh, that was, uh, after the cooled exhaust gas recirculation, the ability to control emissions in cylinder had pretty much run its course. And so we had to make the transition to exhaust after treatment systems to further clean up the exhaust. Catalytic converters have been on passenger cars for quite a long time, but not uh, the after-treatment technology had really, with the exception of some oxidation catalysts, had not migrated into, um, into diesels. And so we introduced diesel particulate filters uh, in order to be able to do another step change in uh, particulate emissions from, from diesel engines. So today, if you see diesel engines going down the road, uh, if they've been produced since 2007, there's no smoke coming from the, uh, from the tailpipe. Um, so the combination of uh, diesel particulate filters and then subsequently NOx after treatment, and there are a couple of, uh, couple of flavors of that. The uh, selective catalytic reduction is the one that is most well known uh, today and broadly applied, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then uh, a NOx adsorber technology that was an interim technology that was very important to us uh, in the 2007 timeframe with our Dodge Ram uh, pickup trucks. So I thought I would, uh, the after treatment technology is interesting. It's a little bit outside the field of mechanical engineering. So I thought I'd at least throw some things out for the chemists and chemical engineers uh, in the crowd. Uh, starting with a particulate filter, it really is just literally that. It's extruded ceramic uh, that you can see the parallel channels with the little black blocks at each end. They are alternately blocked at each end of the uh, channel so that the exhaust gas has to flow into a channel through the wall and then exit the adjacent channel. So uh, engineers gave this the clever name of a wall flow filter. Um, so that you can, and it does a really good job of reducing particulate. It's very difficult to make these less than 98% efficient. Uh, so the, if you followed any of the health effects work that's been going on with diesels uh, over the years, including the IARC uh, review that was done a year and a half ago in Lyon looking at uh, the carcinogenicity of diesel exhaust, they recognized that what a huge step change it was and how this actually transformed the chemical composition, the character uh, of diesel particulate uh, or diesel uh, exhaust. So that's been a big deal. It is uh, not quite as big as you would think on that slide. It is embedded in a cylindrical extrusion that has uh, on the order of 400 cells per square inch. So in a, in a filter that is about 10 inches in diameter and, and about a foot long, you have the surface area of a football field uh, as the filtration area that, uh, that is used to collect up the particulate. So that's been a big deal for us. Uh, all the diesel engines that are out uh, on the road today, in fact, since 2007, have these. And this typically um, uh, 
uh, extruded uh, corioite uh, material that is also coated with a catalyst, with an oxidation catalyst. Uh, selective catalytic reduction is, uh, is a way to do uh, NOx reduction in, uh, in the exhaust. It also has efficiencies that are above 95% uh, in the warm exhaust. It uses uh, urea to generate ammonia that will react with, uh, with NOx in the exhaust and uh, reduce it to nitrogen and oxygen. And, and just to be uh, a little bit nerdy, uh, here are the equations that go along. With that, uh, you, you really, the reaction goes uh, with NO2, uh, goes best with, uh, with NO2, not exclusively, but um, you really want to kick the NO up to NO2 in order to be able to get the reduction reaction to go. The hydrolysis uh, from urea is a thermal reaction that happens in the gas phase. It's delivered into the face of, the, uh, of a catalyst that looks very much like the one that I showed you before. Uh, and then uh, on the SCR catalyst, the ammonia reacts with the NO and the NO2 in order to form nitrogen and water. The reason we call it selective, selective is the ammonia reacts selectively with uh, nitrogen in order to be able to reduce the nitrogen. You may see some non-selective, if you've heard of lean NOx catalysts in the past that use hydrocarbons for reduction, essentially that's a non-selective reaction. Hydrocarbon just reacts with anything that will oxidize it, so the oxygen, uh, and with the nitrogen or with the, with the NOx. It takes a lot more hydrocarbon if you're reacting with oxygen as well as NOx in order to do the reduction. So selective reduction allows you to use less of the reductant, carry less of it on board, make it a much more efficient uh, system to apply to the diesel engines and gives much higher efficiency. The NOx adsorber was really a special case. Um, it, in the 2007 time frame, uh, we were looking for opportunities to reduce NOx from, from our engines. There were, uh, there were some credit opportunities. We had uh, a very special case with the Dodge Ram pickup truck, which is a light duty certification, a chassis certification. So the, uh, the operating environment for the engine and for the after treatment is quite different. It's lower temperature than for a, for a heavy duty engine. And it kicked the door open for us to do some work with uh, NOx adsorbers. Uh, it is a way to do NOx reduction uh, without the use of urea, which was not widely available in the 2007 time frame. Uh, it also allows us to apply essentially three-way catalyst technology to diesels, which is not as straightforward as it might seem. For a three-way catalyst to work, you have to have no oxygen uh, in the exhaust. And so you know that all the gasoline cars out here with three-way catalysts have, oxidation, have oxygen sensors in the exhaust to allow the controls to operate them right at stoichiometric. So on average, they're around stoichiometric and there's no excess oxygen in the exhaust. And that way, the three-way catalyst or the NOx-reducing catalyst uh, embedded in that can separate the nitrogen from the oxygen and NOx and, and uh, exhaust it as nitrogen and oxygen. A diesel engine always operates with excess air in normal operating conditions. So you're, instead of mixing the air and fuel ahead of time and then lighting it off like you do in a, in a spark ignited engine, with a diesel engine, uh, you compress air and then inject the fuel. The fuel has to vaporize and mix with the air uh, and then burn. So if you want to imagine what's going on inside a diesel engine and combustion chamber, imagine a flamethrower. Uh, and so having that going on, you always have to have excess air or you'll make a lot of soot in the process, and so being able to apply the three-way catalyst to a diesel engine was not straightforward. NOx adsorbers allow us to be able to capture the NOx during the normal lean operation of the engine, and then very briefly run the engine rich uh, in order to be able to reduce the NOx. With a particulate filter, even though we were generating some soot during that rich mode, uh, it allowed us to collect it up and be able to do the, uh, the catalyst magic in the exhaust. So using a, uh, a barium oxide substrate, the barium oxide will pull nitrogen, pull the NOx out of the exhaust, store it as a barium nitrate when you have excess air, and then periodically, uh, and this, is, this would happen for about a minute and a half in operation, and then for less than five seconds you run rich. It allows you to introduce the hydrocarbon and get the reduction reactions going uh, across the barium nitrate. This was as much a controls opportunity or a controls problem as it was um, a chemistry problem because you can imagine you've got a truck going down the road. It's got a variable geometry turbocharger. It's got a flexible common rail fuel system. It's got the, 
an exhaust gas recirculation system, and it's got the NOx adsorber and particulate filter in the exhaust. The adjustments in air fuel ratio had to be occurring every, uh, about every minute and a half, and it has to happen so that the driver doesn't know it's happening. The last thing you want is to be going down the road and have your pickup truck going eh, 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 while it's doing its magic in the exhaust. The controls engineers did a phenomenal job on this. And again, it's an opportunity for uh, system integration uh, that was really raised our game to a much higher level as we were uh, doing this work. Uh, system architecture is really important. It's not a one-size-fits-all thing. I won't drag you through all this, but of the technologies that we developed, some apply better in some cases than in others. So for industrial and on-highway products, depending on the environment and depending on the, uh, the application and the duty cycle of the, uh, of the system, we mix and match these technologies to meet the relevant uh, emission standards. One good example is for agricultural equipment, exhaust gas recirculation was something that we delayed as long as we could because you've got to be able to reject the heat from the vehicle. If you've got a truck going down the road at 60 miles an hour, that's not a, uh, it's not that hard to do. If you've got a combine crawling across a field at five miles an hour and you have to run a 100 horsepower hydraulic fan to be able to reduce the heat, uh, to reject the heat, that's not a great thing from a fuel consumption standpoint. So we take those sort of things into account when we're looking at which technologies we apply uh, for emissions control in the various applications. Back to the first chart, uh, the customers have to like it uh, in order to buy it. So if the story's been Knox in particular up until this point, uh, sort of looking back, looking forward, uh, the name of the game is turning to greenhouse gas emissions, which is mostly CO2. Uh, so I'm spending a fair amount of my personal time these days involved with some of the policy development uh, and technology development for uh, greenhouse gas control from, uh, from our uh, vehicles and engines. Uh, there are a number of things we work on. This just sort of give you an, uh, an idea of the category of uh, technologies that we're developing. And of course, CO2 and emissions, uh, CO2 emissions and fuel efficiency are just two sides of the same coin. So at least for once, the EPA and our customers are telling us the same thing, burn less fuel to do, uh, to do the work. Um, idle reduction, low carbon fuels are, uh, are pretty straightforward. If you have less carbon in the fuel, if you're not idling the engine, uh, you're not uh, making the same number of uh, CO2 emissions. High efficiency clean combustion is something that we work on a lot. Greg Shaver has been involved in that and a number of the other things uh, here at the Herrick Lab at the Cummins Power Lab. Um, and, uh, and low temperature after treatment to make that more efficient, to use less energy in order to make these chemical reactions to occur. Uh, but I thought I, I would talk about maybe some higher level system um, work that we're doing. You know how hybrids work, uh, generally speaking, uh, and, but you may not be as familiar with waste heat recovery, and I thought I'd spend a little time uh, telling you about that new technology that we're working on. Basically, what you're trying to do with both hybrids and with waste heat recovery is, is to recapture waste energy that you're throwing away one way or another, either by putting the brakes on and turning it into heat as you're slowing a vehicle down, or uh, by uh, energy that's going out in the exhaust or through the cooling system that you're, you're not able to capture. If, you've, um, if you think about how the hybrids work, if they stop very frequently, you need frequent start stops, you've got a lot of opportunity to capture kinetic energy that you've put in the vehicle, recover that, put it in a battery, and then use that to, uh, to accelerate the vehicle again. As the frequency of stops drops, the fuel economy advantage of a hybrid uh, is lost because you just don't have as many opportunities for that uh, energy recovery event. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at uh, the waste energy that you're taking from, from an engine, uh, the higher the power load, uh, that you're running the higher average power, so less starting and stopping and more just sort of running hard down the, the interstate, the more heat you're generating, the more opportunity you have to, um, to recover that heat. And so that's a, that's a technology that we have, we're looking at for heavy duty applications and also for power generation applications where you have stationary gen sets that are running at high power. Uh, so a little more about that. If you think about the energy that you pull out of a fuel tank uh, for a diesel engine, about a third of it makes it to the power to the rear wheels, about a third of it goes out as heat through the exhaust, and about a third of it goes uh, out as heat through the radiator. And so we want to capture that lost heat 
uh, and put it back to work. And so we're basically running a steam cycle. It's a bottoming cycle, if you're familiar with that, but running a steam cycle off the, uh, the waste energy by using a turbine, a small steam turbine. That's not literally water steam. We use a refrigerant. But uh, to use that to generate uh, uh, steam in order to be able to power it, and it's a closed cycle. So, uh, so it is, we've, we've all learned about bottoming cycles during the course of doing some of our thermodynamics, uh, but it really hasn't made its way into uh, practical applications for, uh, for most uses. The turbo compound is pretty close to that, but certainly not running a steam cycle off of the waste heat. Uh, but that's the sort of thing we're doing. Now, some of you might be thinking, I've, read the, I've ridden the steam locomotive at Disneyland. How are you going to get that under the hood of a truck? Um, so here's one of our 15-liter engines that has exhaust gas recirculation on it where we already have a cooler in place. Essentially, we can replace that exhaust gas cooler with a boiler for the waste heat recovery. And here's what it looks like with the waste heat recovery. So it's a very nice installation. It's a nice integration with the engine. It allows us to get on the order of 4 to 5 percent improvement in fuel economy. Uh, one of the things we look at in our, uh, from a commercial standpoint is can we generate an 18-month payback period on any technology that we put in place for a heavy-duty truck? Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're on the order of 24-month payback period uh, as we're starting to move toward product development with this. If you give me another 50 cents a gallon of diesel fuel, I can get it to 18 months, and I think by the time we're, we're there, uh, we'll have it. So that's work we're doing on, uh, on waste heat recovery. We've integrated that into a program called Super Truck, was funded by the Department of Energy. A number of companies were... Uh, we're funded to do this work. We're actually are doing it in partnership with, uh, with PACAR. If you saw President Obama's announcement of the Phase 2 greenhouse gas rules, you would have seen this lovely backdrop of the Cummins truck uh, uh, to the side as he was making that announcement. Uh, uh, so as we're working on improving engine efficiency, this is a history over time from the 1990s, the exhaust gas recirculation. You can see that uh, bump down in 2002 time frame where it took energy away from the combustion event in order to make such a big step in NOx reduction. In 2010, when we went to exhaust after treatment with selective catalytic reduction, we got that efficiency back. Uh, now we're looking at moving to 50 and 55 percent. Those were the targets that we set for super truck using waste heat recovery and some of the advanced combustion work and, and some electrification of the vehicle. We've actually got moved from 6% to, or 6 miles per gallon to 10.7 miles per gallon on this truck. So we've done uh, better than 25% improvement in fuel economy. We've demonstrated all those uh, uh, milestones early and in time for the EPA and, uh, and NHTSA to be considering technologies like that as a foundation for the next round of uh, greenhouse gas standards. In fact, we had Andy Brown in the National Academy of uh, Sciences group at Cummins yesterday discussing uh, these technologies. It's not just good for trucks. Uh, we've integrated these technologies into uh, generator sets. Uh, these are gensets that uh, have, have gone to Afghanistan with 20 percent improvement in fuel economy and they weigh 800 pounds less than the gensets they replace. If you're in a wartime environment, the single biggest expense uh, is diesel fuel, uh, delivering diesel fuel to the front. And so you can imagine uh, these guys are pretty happy with the improvements we've been able to make uh, on that front. The last thing I'd like to talk about is now, you know, sort of looking back, I've looked forward, I want to look out a bit as we expand our horizons and products from uh, things we've been doing in and around Indiana to, uh, to, to parts uh, outside of Indiana and, and well beyond Indiana. We have a global engineering footprint, so although we're headquartered here, we do about half of our R&D in Indiana. We have tech centers around the world. It keeps my average altitude at about 10,000 feet uh, as I am moving around to try to make those connections. I've been in India, China, and South America already this year, and I've got uh, another round to go. At least it was nice not to have to shovel snow for a couple of weeks uh, while I was out. Uh, but I spend a lot of time doing that and a lot of our other engineering leaders to be able to integrate our technical operations. So instead of being independent technical centers around the world, that they can really function like nodes in a network and do the integration, uh, the collaboration uh, as they're working together. One of the things that they can do from a local perspective, though, is allow us 
insight into the local markets. So Cummins over the course of the last 10 or 15 years has migrated from taking products that were really designed for North America and Western Europe and sold into the premium parts of the markets around the world and look at what do we need to do to be able to penetrate into more of the mainstream markets. This has been, you know, part of, part of what we've been able to do is enable uh, emissions controls in those parts of the world that have not been available with some of the local technologies. Um, but as we look at, uh, as we're a global company, one of the things that we always have to balance from a product architecture standpoint is how can we be more efficient as a technical organization with a coherent set of product platforms that we can then apply around the world, uh, as opposed to doing a uh, unique solution uh, that's much less efficient and much more expensive uh, for all the applications. And so we spend a lot of time looking at the balance between standardization and proliferation. We talk to ourselves as if we were making uh, global products in the past, but really those were very much from uh, U.S. perspective, and we found that as we're making products that are more fit for the market around the world, that we have to tolerate a bit more uh, proliferation in our product platforms. And I tell our engineers, if you're not feeling tension, you're not in the right place. Uh, so there's always a tension between wanting to have uh, a little more customization or, uh, or being more um, efficient. So as we think about this and we think about those market themes that I talked about earlier, you know, if you look at North America, you see products like this, and this was the experience of many of our engineers. If you get outside North America, you start to see scenes uh, that look a bit more like this. So these are shots, in fact, with the exception of a couple of these photographs, they're shots that I took myself. Uh, as I was out uh, sort of taking the engineers out and, and learning more about the environment. Uh, these are uh, our photographs that I made in India. The road uh, infrastructure there is not as well developed as it is in the U.S. The trucks tend to go slower, and so to get productivity, you put the loads up. Uh, and you can see that uh, some of these are fairly uh, overloaded. I had our head of engineering in China saying, yeah, those may seem overloaded in India, but if you want to see an overloaded truck, we know how to load a truck. <laughs> And China. So, uh, so this is the kind of environment that, uh, that we're operating in. It's also the, the maintenance environment. As you can imagine, it's quite different. I went to Beijing Public Transit, one of our most sophisticated customers, and when I was standing on the dirt floor in the room where they maintain our engines, you know, it gives you a different perspective from a design standpoint of what you have to do to be robust in that environment. And I can tell you, if you have never driven that road from Mumbai to Pune, and seen an entire powertrain of a truck going, a truck on chocks that couldn't quite make it up the hill with the powertrain spread out on the side of the road with mechanics going back and forth on motor scooters uh, to get parts to put the thing back together again. You don't quite get the difference in the uh, maintenance environment uh, as you get out into places like that compared to, to the US. So it's been a lot of fun to see that. We also see very sophisticated products in these places. This is a truck that uh, in Tata, uh, in, it has developed in India. In the U.S., this truck would have an 11 to 15 liter engine in it. In India, it has a 6 liter engine in it. Uh, part of the thing you learn, uh, not just engineering, but it's economics. If you look at the cost of operation in the U.S. or in Europe, a big chunk of it is fuel, a very small part is capital recovery, and another big part is uh, driver expense. So in the U.S., the truck manufacturers actually think a lot about keeping the drivers happy so they can uh, retain them because it's a pretty big investment in their training. If you go to India, fuel is an even bigger factor, but look at the capital cost. It's now 35%. First cost means a lot. And so having a six liter engine and the drivers, uh, the cost for the driver is not that great and it, they're not that big a factor. And so you'll see a completely different economic that's driving the design of these products. And as engineers, you really gotta be tuned into that to be sure that we're delivering the right products uh, for the local economy. Uh, finally, the, just sort of to, to bring this sort of seeing things around the world together, the Japanese have a term called gemba. It means going out to the place of the customer and seeing it for yourself. And that's really what I would, I encourage all the engineers and would encourage all of you to do if you haven't had that opportunity, to really be able to get out and see how products are being uh, operated and used. Uh, I did not take this picture. And if I had had a 400 millimeter lens, I might have. But uh, Byron, we start talking about uh, composite fuel tanks uh, that keep this picture in mind.
Uh, <clears throat> I did take this picture. It's an interesting application of a turbocharger. Uh, in order to do biomass gasification in India, you've got to be able to start the gasifier by getting the air to flow. And once you do, uh, now you can generate this, what essentially looks like uh, producer gas that we can run an engine on. So this guy gets on pedals like hell to get the airflow going so we can light off the biomass gasifier and then we can run the engine. Uh, so it was a novel, I thought it was a pretty novel approach. I was happy enough for him to be able to do it. It gives another uh, definition of high cycle fatigue, I suppose. <laughs> uh, getting out into the, into the environment and seeing the, the maintenance environment uh, I've already talked about, but the other benefit is you get to meet some very interesting characters while you're along the way. This was in the middle of the Amazon River in Manaus. And I will tell you, I had more bars on my cell phone in the middle of the Amazon River than I have in my backyard in Columbus, Indiana. <laughs> so, there's a, so, th so you get both sides of the technology story uh, when you're out there. Uh, so the way we're doing product development today, uh, we have our latest engine, the 2.8, 3.8 liter uh, engine that we developed in China with engineering from the U.S., from the U.K., from Brazil, from India, and from China involved. As we sell that product, we're selling it into China. We actually sold more engines into Russia in the first two years of production than we did into China. We're taking it into Southeast Asia, to Australia, to South America, and bringing it to the U.S., uh, and to Europe. That's the world that we live in today with, uh, with the engineering. Uh, a lot of technology being developed in Indiana by Indiana engineers, but also being done uh, in collaboration with, uh, with the other engineers around the world. So to support our growth, we built new tech centers in China. We built a new tech center in, uh, in Wuhan. Uh, we built a new tech center in Pune that's under construction. And our very newest tech center is in Seymour, Indiana. Uh, and with all that, uh, our objective is to continue to deliver innovation you can depend on. Thanks very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you, John. You've set the standard, I think, for the wonderful uh, conveyance of information about the modern manufacturing world that you live in, that we, of course, live in as well and that we prepare these engineering students uh, here at Purdue to participate in the future. I'd now like to introduce my colleague uh, from Boeing, um, and I haven't yet seen him. Can he hold his, there you are. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, you're sitting right there, and, and indeed we've met earlier, I'm sure. Um, I, want to talk, I want to introduce Terrence Beeshold who's Vice President and Chief Project Officer for Engineer, really, for the 777X, which is uh, Boeing's new airplane. Um, I might add that we'll have a composite wing, uh, for those of you who know about carbon fiber composites, uh, my field of specialty, and uh, I'm delighted about that. And I'm delighted that you're here to share with us uh, something about what the, uh, perhaps one of the major export industries in this country uh, has to say about manufacturing in the future. But I'm also pleased to know that uh, you spent uh, some time in, in executive roles with the 787, a Boeing airplane, which is an all composite airplane. Uh, over 50% of the structural weight is made in carbon fiber epoxy. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful innovation that led the world in applying these materials in, in that had been applied obviously in the defense industry now to the commercial aviation industry. He's a mechanical engineer, began his work at Douglas, which was Douglas Aircraft at that time, later McDonnell Douglas, and now Boeing, as our industry has, has come together. And he's worked quite a bit on the DC uh, at KC-10 Hydro Mechanical Group. Uh, so he has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and uh, brings uh, lots of experience in our commercial aviation industry to us and like to share those thoughts today. Thank you, please. Well, thank you, Byron. Um, I'm very pleased to be here in the land of the Boilermakers and I want to start with one fact that I want you to think about. In the current 24 hour period right now, over two and a half million 
parts will finish their journey through a production system that spans the globe. Every day, two and a half million parts coming together, leaving our final assembly center in uh, Washington and in Charleston. So if you can imagine the infrastructure and the logistics, and you think about manufacturing uh, and the, the integration of that across the world, it's amazing, frankly. And so I'm gonna share some perspectives on global design and manufacturing and how uh, that's able to be done. Uh, go ahead. So first, just as a little context, probably most know what Boeing does, but just in case, uh, you know, we're, we're divided up into different segments. Number one, the commercial segment. Uh, we design, uh, manufacture, and support commercial airplanes. Um, you know, we have five current models that we produce, and uh, we're in the process of developing eight new models that will uh, continue to ref refresh the fleet. And uh, we provide support and services to all of those commercial airplanes. And then uh, from a defense system, similarly, we design, manufacture, and support a wide array of defense systems ranging from uh, military transports to tankers to fighters uh, to rotorcraft. Uh, and then, of course, we also are in the space business, and uh, we're very much involved in uh, both commercial and military satellites where we design and build satellites and launch vehicles. We've got a rich partnership with NASA and are a prime contractor to the International Space Station. And then on top of that, we, we do a lot of large-scale systems integration and network solutions. Uh, we have a financing branch that helps bring financing solutions to our customers. But underneath it all, what we do and what we love to do best is innovate. Uh, that really fuels uh, a lot of the products that we are able to offer to our customers. And it's that innovation and that research that we do in partnership with great universities like Purdue and many businesses that uh, just really fuel some of the very cool things we're able to, to offer. Simply said, um, you know, we really, Boeing is about connecting and protecting the people of the world. Goes back to what was said at the very beginning. Engineering really has that humanitarian, bringing people together underlying theme, and we're proud to have that be our primary objective, to connect and protect the people of the world. So uh, a little bit about the commercial part of Boeing. So we're headquartered, of course, in Puget Sound, and we employ about 80,000 people all over the globe. And um, if you just look at last year, uh, we captured over $53 billion in revenue, so the business continues to grow. Um, and that's really through offering a complete family of airplanes and all of the support and services that go with them uh, to all of our customers. An amazing thing to think about is currently, today, three quarters of the entire world's fleet are Boeing airplanes. That's huge. That's 12,000 12, airplanes flying every day. And go back one here. Um, if you think about the airplanes we're selling today, 70% of those sales are actually uh, international sales. So in that kind of environment, you can understand why Boeing really must be a global company, both with uh, supply and with customer support across uh, all of those countries. So just to add a little more context, in this 24-hour period, four million people will fly on a Boeing airplane. That's 30,000 departures every day and 30,000 arrivals <laughs> safely arriving. That's huge. Those flights in this one 24-hour period of time will fly 38 million miles. It's hard to get your mind around that kind of infrastructure and that kind of uh, industry. 
So, uh, how, do, how does that happen? <laughs> how do you get to a place where you have that kind of uh, massive uh, ecosystem? Well, it takes leveraging the entire enterprise. It takes leveraging many businesses across the United States and the world. It takes a lot of collaboration with universities in driving new research, new technologies. Think about it, those customers, uh, 150 different countries represented there. And we have employees in almost half of those countries, Boeing employees. Uh, think about the supply chain across the entire enterprise, both commercial and defense, that's 21,000 suppliers employing a million employees. So you talk about this business and economic growth, it's huge. Of course, the partnerships both internationally and here at home with the universities are a key enabler for a lot of the things that we do. Composite technology was mentioned before and it's been great to have the partnership with Purdue uh, to develop some of the material technologies that we've used on the 787 and will be using on the 777X. So it really truly is a worldwide reach uh, to be able to be in this business. Now some ask, okay, that's interesting, but where's it going? Is it gonna be like this? Well, one way to answer that question is looking back over the past 30 years or so, air travel has continued to grow roughly at a 5% uh, increase year over year. And that despite multiple recessions, different financial crises across the globe, um, different conflicts around the world, and even in the, the dark days after September 11 and the things that followed, you see there was a downturn, but it picked right back up. So 5% year over year, and as we look forward over the next 20 years, uh, we see that that trend will continue. So this, this is a lot of data on one chart, but it's uh, pretty amazing. When you start projecting over the next 20 years, that represents about 35,000 airplanes that will be needed to support all of the world's airline and cargo operators. And if you look at how that market is broken up, on the left side, this, I mean, this is a $4.8 trillion market. That's why everybody's eager to get in it, not just Airbus and Boeing being the two predominant players, but a lot of other companies are very interested in trying to get into this market. And you can see where, where that growth is. The single aisle represents almost half uh, that represents about 23,000 airplanes over 20 years. And single aisle, of course, is about 90 to 240 passenger airplanes. Think 737, think A320s. And they typically are for the short range missions, of course, uh, in uh, domestic flights or connecting adjacent regions. And we see over the next 20 years a lot of these airplanes will be replaced, but also a lot of the markets continue to open up. And this is what's so cool about this industry is as markets opened up, we start connecting more and more people around the world. The other half, actually it's more than half, is in the twin aisle. The, uh, the medium, the small, medium, and large wide bodies uh, represent a huge amount of uh, new airplane growth. And as we introduce more fuel-efficient airplanes that can go longer distance, we're going to see this whole market expand, yes, but a lot of the growth here is replacing current airplanes. In 20 years, most of the airplanes flying in this market today will be retired and replaced with much, much more fuel-efficient airplanes like the 787 or the A350 or the 777X that's coming. You can see where a lot of this growth uh, is by region. Uh, the Pacific Rim, Asia, is a huge area of growth. Europe and um, you know North America, the Middle East contribute. But it, 
definitely is a worldwide market. So the economic impact of such a big industry is, is significant. $2.2 trillion of global economic impact. This represents 3.5% of the world's GDP. And in this industry, commercial aviation in its entirely, entirety uh, supports over 50 million jobs. So as we look ahead, you know, this is a huge opportunity for economic growth across the entire base that supports this industry. So let's get back to these commercial airplanes. You can see our, fi our current five uh, production models there represented. You can see how many parts it takes to build each one of those airplanes. And an interesting note, you know, the 787 with the all composite uh, fuselage and wing uh, is about the same size as a 767. And look at how many parts it takes to build a 787 with these large one-piece barrels that we produce on large mandrels. Um, so it's an efficiency uh, that new technology has brought in being able to manufacture uh, these kind of very fuel-efficient airplanes. But that's, that's a massive uh, production system, if you will. Producing this year probably will break one billion parts produced to fuel all of these production lines. 737 right now is humming at 42 airplanes a month, okay? And we're going higher. So it's a lot of production that spans the globe. And that's why, for engineers, you gotta think not only the airplane performance, but you have to think about how will you be producing these airplanes? How do you create a lean, efficient design that lends itself to this kind of environment? You know, our supply chain, I talked about 5,400 supplier factories around the globe producing parts uh, for these airplanes. We have supplier factories on six of the seven continents. And last time I checked, I don't think we're building anything in Antarctica, but you never know. It's a huge footprint, and you can see the spin there, $35 billion spent. Uh, that's a huge opportunity for businesses to be able to get into this, this industry and be able to create value. 500,000 people directly supporting this. In fact, more locally, Indiana. Indiana, we have a lot of business in Indiana. There are 129 businesses that we work with in Indiana. I think last year we spent about $370 million in Indiana. And th that work statement drove estimated 12,000 direct or indirect jobs. In fact, we have 100 Boeing employees in Indiana. So the, the reach is both here in the United States, but also abroad. Uh, so there's a huge international collaboration, clearly, with such a high percentage of sales uh, overseas, and the, this collaboration really has a long, rich history. Japan, for example, we've, we have connections back in Japan that go back 60 years, both from a manufacturing standpoint, but also from a customer, the airlines. And uh, it's through those relationships that we continue to grow and uh, create capability uh, in Japan or China for 40 years, or UAE for 20 years, Russia, Brazil. So those partnerships abroad are very important to Boeing. So I want to get more specific now. As Byron mentioned, I spent six years on 787, first as the chief engineer for systems, and then led the integration at the vehicle level for a couple of years. And uh, you know, this was the first airplane where we realized that you can always make an airplane that might be incrementally a little better, but what the world needed was a significant increase in improvement, whether it be 20% lower fuel uh, burn, 
whether it be uh, much lower emissions. Um, so we came together on the 77 and across the board uh, made significant strides in technology across the board, not just the, the large scale composite structure technology, but the systems as well. Going to a more electric architecture. This airplane with the electrical generators on those engines can produce about one and a half megawatts of power. It's a lot of power. Can power a couple little towns with one of those airplanes. And it's really uh, taking off the pneumatic systems, the bleed air systems that take away some of the efficiency of the engine and replacing it with electrical, which is a much more efficient way of uh, developing the power. Uh, a lot of the avionics, the flight deck, um, being able to, at the very beginning, focus on the passenger experience. So how many here have flown in the last week or so? A lot of people. I know some flying more than others. <laughs> so uh, it used to be it was a lot of fun to fly. Not so much these days, especially after you spend an hour uh, you know, trying to just get through the airport. So with this airplane, there was a very conscious, intentional focus by the engineering team. How do we bring the joy back into flying? So how do we make that cabin experience just much, much better? So with this airplane, using the composite uh, technology, we were able to open up the windows substantially larger. Um, we were able to lower the cabin altitude uh, to 6,000 feet maximum. We were able to do that because of the way composites, uh, uh, the characteristics of composite structure. We were able to bring more humidity into the cabin, uh, bring HEPA filtration into the cabin, use our sophisticated flight control laws to dampen out the vertical accelerations when you're going through turbulent air, using lighting you know, LED lighting throughout the cabin, just to create a much better, nicer environment so that after you're sleeping, you don't flip on the lights, the bright fluorescent lights and wake everybody up, you can have a gentle sunrise inside the cabin. These little details, engineers had a lot of fun de developing a cabin experience that would go a long ways to just improving the overall um, experience. So from a global supply chain, this was another thing where we went uh, with the 77. You can see the global footprint of where the various parts of this airplane are manufactured. And we have a lot of the design and manufacturing capability on this airplane was distributed among a lot of these uh, suppliers and partners. Uh, starting with the nose, for example, the nose section, compo all composite construction. Uh, partnering with Spirit in Wichita. Uh, you move aft and you have the forward mid-body section uh, being produced by Kawasaki in Japan. The mid-body in purple there, Alenia, uh, produces that section and then we do a lot of the integration uh, in Charleston. Uh, moving to the aft cabin, the aft cabin's produced in Charleston. The fin produced in Washington and and we've got capability in Salt Lake as well. Uh, the wings, uh, Mitsubishi in Japan uh, manufactures the wing box. The trailing edge, Boeing Australia. The leading edge, the slats, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, the engines, you know, we have both GE and Rolls Royce on this airplane. The uh, nacelle, Goodrich, down in Chula Vista. So such a broad collection of suppliers and partners, engineering capability around the globe, manufacturing capability, the logistics of bringing all these parts together when we're running this production program at 10 airplanes a month is a huge undertaking. And it happens through very tight integration. And I want to end just with a couple thoughts about integration, bringing design and manufacturing, and what, as engineers, we need to be thinking about when we do programs like this and as we begin undertaking the 777X. 
First of all, you know, it starts with systems engineering 101 requirements. You must have absolute clarity and alignment on fundamental requirements. And that seems probably pretty fundamental, but sometimes we get we lose that. And and it causes issues and problems. But making sure you have requirements that have been fully validated and that everybody's working to the same set of requirements, that's particularly important when you have such a distributed uh, production system. And then as you go through the development process, it's all about having really good situational awareness of where the design is. And on the 787, it was very important that we actually had the entire design in a single source of data versus a distributed design collaboration environment. That way, whether you were in Wichita, in Puget Sound, or in Nagoya, Japan, you were looking at the same thing. You were, you were designing one airplane. And you're in the design environment. Too often I see places designing by PowerPoint. You need to keep people in the design tools developing the airplane in the, in the, uh, with the, the solid modeling geometry with the full integrated uh, airplane available for all to, to work with. So keeping everyone in a constant, in a consistent set of tools and processes is vital. Uh, having people think, as I said earlier, about how do you design for a production system. Engineers love to design the coolest new thing, right? That's what we do. We design. And the more uh, complex sometimes we feel that's better. And I would argue it's actually more difficult to be able to design something in simplicity that can do all of the mission performance requirements of 20% lower fuel burn. How do you do that and design simply? Because when you design simply, it typically means you can produce it more readily. Typically means that the airplane goes together more efficiently. Uh, and we also have to be mindful of cost. We're in a very, very competitive market. Today, Boeing enjoys 70% of the fleet being Boeing airplanes. That's been changing. Airbus, our competitor, has been very aggressive in the market. And so we have to be able to continue to provide the type of high value products at, at lower cost. So our engineers need to be very mindful of what does it cost to produce that design. And historically, that data has not been made available. And we at Boeing are making that data available. How can you not have that available? And the really cool thing, engineers, when given those requirements and the performance requirements and the production system requirements, no problem. We can do it, right? We just haven't if you haven't made that data and made those requirements really important to the design build teams. A couple other things, um, you know, having that kind of distributed manufacturing footprint, it's really important that you have full situa situational awareness of one integrated plan, looking down not just to the partners, but to the partners' suppliers and the supplier suppliers, all the way down into the raw material, frankly. Because any one of those things can, <laughs> when you're producing at those kind of production rates, any problem anywhere in that supply chain can bring you to your knees. So having one plan fully integrated across that supply base and having good situational awareness of the production system is key to running a healthy company and being able to capture that huge market opportunity going forward. So uh, getting back to where I started, huge market um, and just a tremendous opportunity for us to be able to continue to connect and protect people of the globe uh, at the Boeing Company. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Terry, thank you very much. That was, that was, as you know, I was sitting on the edge of my chair listening to that because it's been 
very interesting to watch uh, some of these technologies develop over the last 40 years and to see that they are reaching their potential and, and that Boeing is uh, very much engaged in, in doing just that. Now we turn our attention to uh, uh, the president of, of uh, the, the university is, is uh, coming to uh, present. Is he here today? Uh, do we have him? Oh, there he is in the back row, please. So uh, some of you may not have met our president. And, and if you go around town in Indiana, anywhere, you will see uh, uh, bumper stickers that say, my man, Mitch. And I want you to know that uh, the Indianians really believe that. But here at Purdue, we say our president, Mitch. <laughs> and we're delighted to have him. He's, uh, he's brought a, an excitement to our campus, I think, that's unusual. Um, he's brought innovation to us with his great experience. He's the 12th president of Purdue University. Um, and it, you might also know him, as we know, as the 49th governor of the state of Indiana, having served two terms before he came here to be our president, um, bringing all that experience with how you bring together society around uh, the subject of managing its problems and its opportunities, and especially its opportunities in terms of economic development. Certainly gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce him, but just a couple of words about him. Uh, you know, he was the CEO of the Hudson Institute and the president of E.I. Lilly and Company. He's been in the world, uh, very active in it. He was senior advisor to President Reagan and a director of, office, uh, of the Office of Management and Budget under George Bush. So he certainly knows Washington. We found that to be the case. What uh, gives me great pleasure is that he holds his bachelor's degree from Princeton University, a fine institution with, which I attended earlier, and uh, has his law degree from Georgetown. So our president, Mitch Daniels, knows great university qualities, and we're delighted to have him here share some of those thoughts with us today. President. Well, thanks to my good friend Byron. Welcome to our prestigious guest from um, uh, the most prestigious organization, at least uh, in, in the eyes of this campus, anywhere. Um, I, uh, was, is President Moat, is he come and gone? Uh, oh, oh, right in front. Yeah, Dan, hi, I'm sorry, I walked right by you. Welcome. It's really a treat to have you here and, uh, and, uh, and uh, each of your members. Um, I, uh, it, what Byron said is true. I have lived in both the worlds that predominate in this room, uh, a long time in the business world, a short time in higher education. And um, people have asked me, you know, always ask me, so what's the difference? And I, I'll tell them, um, well, in business it was dog eat dog, but in higher ed it's just the opposite. Okay. <laughs> and I'm gonna be respectful of your time here. You've got a great busy agenda with more illuminating people to, to listen to than, than I. But um, uh, I was talking to a Purdue alum, I think he's in the aerospace business, and he, uh, he, he claims that on a, on a family vacation, his 10-year-old looked out the window and said, um, uh, some maybe, I think it was complex irrigation equipment or something, said, how does that work? And he said, said no, Dad, M Mom, you tell me. I don't want the engineering version. <laughs> so I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll try not to give you the engineering version. Um, I. Uh, I just want to make a few comments about how well chosen I think your venue is for this particular uh, group, but specifically for the theme of this particular uh, conference uh, about manufacturing, uh, its place in the American economy, and maybe specifically in the economy of the region represented, uh, most represented here. Uh, you really are at the right place in at least two respects. Uh, you're in the right state. This is the most manufacturing intensive state in America. So manufacturing jobs as a percentage of all jobs, product as a percentage of all output, number one. Number one in steel. Uh, this, we've leapfrogged in the last eight years, we leapfrogged at least two other states. We're number two by a clear margin over Ohio in auto, uh, the value of auto production here. This is the only state with uh, 
Uh, four Japanese assembly plants, three different companies represented, the only state with two Toyota assembly plants. Uh, world's capital of, uh, oh, recreational vehicle production, things like this. Um, this state added uh, more manufacturing jobs the, uh, than uh, any other in the last year, and since the crater in 2009 has added uh, more than, uh, uh, as a per capita by far than any other state. Um, but moreover, I think, I would submit you're in the right place in the right state when you come to Purdue University. We have a long history of graduating people and performing research of, of direct um, uh, benefit to manufacturing as it has progressed uh, steadily to uh, higher and higher levels of sophistication. Um, we are embarked here on a plan for the next few years that is absolutely centered on, <clears throat> on the STEM disciplines, as we now call them. Uh, Dean Jameson is here, is leading, uh, I believe, America's largest expansion of what is already one of the largest engineering colleges. We graduate year on year more technology, more graduates in technology than anyone, and uh, in a few years that'll be even more true. Leah's in the process of adding a net of well over 100 new faculty. Uh, anyone in the room who's interested, we'll, we'll be gladly accepting applications outside. Um, and um, uh, side by side with her, we are, we are growing the computer science uh, department by uh, 25 to 30 percent and uh, working to transform our College of Technology into uh, a, an even more experiential, hands-on, project-based uh, curriculum aimed at uh, very much at supplying talented new uh, uh, workers and, and leaders for uh, manufacturing and other technology-based industries. Uh, we recently, uh, um, a uh, significant event, I think, to indicate the commitment we have here, and we hope the contribution we're in a position to make at Purdue. I know we have friends from uh, General Electric on the program today, um, General Electric, GE, sorry, uh, and uh, when was the last year they used the term General Electric? I'm probably three decades behind. But um, GE announced that they had selected this uh, neighborhood uh, for their, their newest jet engine plant. And um, uh, along with that, we expect to uh, be able to announce a significant growth in our already robust research program with that company. It's maybe, it's one of the best examples, but it's one of a growing list of examples in which we are uh, eager and, and uh, we believe very well prepared to collaborate with businesses on solving the manufacturing and engineering challenges that, that face them. Now, to speak more generally uh, about this subject uh, around which you're convened, um, I think it's, it's uh, arguable that manufacturing is even more central to American success and to the future of the American economy than it's been in the past. There are circles in which, at least for a while, people acted as though manufacturing was passe and uh, uh, this would be just fine if it all migrated somewhere else, that we'd somehow replace it with service industry or uh, some sort of, in some mysterious fashion, uh, uh, all uh, uh, high-tech or information uh, economy jobs. Um, we know now, if we ever believe that, that that's too simplistic by far. Uh, in fact, if you really care about poor people, if you really care about the maintenance of a strong middle class in this country, with all that means not just economically, but to um, uh, our stability as a democracy. Uh, if, you, uh, if you care about the upward mobility, the sense of optimism and hope around which America has always been organized, then you really have to root for manufacturing and for those who, um, uh, who live it and who build it and who are improving it. Here's a coincidence, uh, uh, you may have just read this, but uh, tomorrow the Bureau of uh, Economic Analysis is going to debut a new and what will probably become a, a closely watched figure by us all. So we all watched, we've all watched the gross national product um, uh, forever as, as sort of as the barometer of how we're doing, how we're growing as a country. But the economists have said for a long time that's really an imperfect measurement. Um, it only captures end value. It skips over the intermediate value of suppliers, 
uh, and and uh, in the chain, which of course uh, uh, is, it predominates in manufacturing as much as anywhere. And so we, if we have a $17 trillion GDP, tomorrow they'll announce a number somewhere north of $30 billion, trillion dollars, uh, as the gross output of the country. And uh, the, the layman's term that they, uh, they're using for this is the, 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 the make it economy. And this is very important. It not only stresses the um, fact that we have underestimated, we've understated the importance of, of the, the, the part of the economy that makes things. Uh, we, and, and the consequence of that is we, we focused or been led to focus uh, to an excessive extent on the consumption side of the economy. So when you measure gross output, you find a much bigger balance between investments and the contributions of manufacturing and other productive uh, sectors uh, relative to pure consumption. And we've probably made some incorrect economic decisions over time by that imbalance, by, by uh, not noticing that imbalance. Now, um, here in the most manufacturing intensive state in the country, a lot has been done over recent years, all aimed at trying to build the friendliest environment possible, the most conducive environment. Uh, in my last job, I used to say the best sandbox in America. And uh, we, were, we were interested in enterprises of all type, kinds and, in fact, worked very hard to diversify a manufacturing dependent economy. But we never took our eye off the manufacturing uh, ball, and I, and I think, I hope Indiana policy will always uh, uh, take, uh, give that the same high priority. And so uh, every policy that, um, that we confronted was tested first and foremost against the question, will this make it more or less likely that the next job comes here? Um, what can we do to lower the cost of hiring Hoosiers? And that ran, that was everything, you know, taxes obviously, but uh, regulation also, for instance, uh, litigation climate. Um, uh, on the regulation front, our guidance to all those people who did such necessary work in protecting the environment, protecting worker safety, and so these other important public interests, the clear guidance we gave them literally from the first day that I was on that job was we expect, that we, we do not intend to soften or lower a single uh, regulatory uh, uh, requirement. But we would want the laws implemented swiftly, consistently, and collaboratively. And I believe and I hope that this will become a, a philosophy that spreads more widely. Uh, no one in manufacturing needs to be told that time is money is not a figure of speech. And if you wait an extra year or two for permits, um, somebody didn't get hired. Uh, likewise, that being told one thing by Inspector A and something different by Inspector B is an extraordinarily expensive and non-productive thing to do. And as I used to remind our, our regulators, those people you're working with, those plants or those facilities, are not the enemy. They are your neighbors. So they are going, in almost every case, to want to do it right. Just help them understand what they need to do to comply. That 1% that don't will throw the book at them. But, but uh, uh, approaching things in that way, I hope, has been um, uh, encouraging and, in and conducive to the growth, in particular, of manufacturing, which uh, rightly is, is uh, among our most regulated industries. This state has invested in infrastructure uh, like no state in the country. And a third of all the bridges were rebuilt in the last eight years. 200 and something major projects uh, were built. It's a long and interesting story I won't tell, but the short, what, what you should care about is we kept a lot of civil engineers very busy. <laughs> and uh, that's a good thing. You know, public investment uh, in long-term capital, goods, uh, roads and bridges and and, and sewers and, uh, and, and these days telecommunications facilities and so forth, energy transmission facilities, extraordinarily important to the growth of a vibrant private economy that, that everything else depends on. Um, so here's another coincidence. Uh, um, I'm a Presbyterian and, you know, 
<clears throat> we're not supposed to believe in coincidence. It's uh, you know that predestination thing. And my former pastor said, when a Presbyterian falls downstairs, he says, "Well, thank goodness I got that over with." <laughs> um, but here's a uh, here's a pure coincidence. I just came with a 45 minutes in between from a luncheon meeting with a very interesting company full of engineers uh, who is. Uh, has been for, de for several generations now in the energy extraction business here in the Midwest where most of it played out some time ago and you have to be pretty good to get anything out and make a buck. But uh, they have uh, been working as many of their, all their competitors have on the new um, breakthroughs in horizontal drilling and so-called fracking and so forth. And they're here to talk about research that might take this the next step and the next step, and I, I learned some fascinating things just in, in an hour plus with, with them. Uh, incidentally, this company just moved from a neighboring state, uh, which I won't name, but it's adjacent to us on the west, <laughs> uh, we, uh, over to Indiana, and, and the, uh, the, he, they told me the, the taxes alone will pay back the cost of the move in less than three years. Um, but the other reason that this is so, it seemed to me, so apropos or so pertinent to your conversation is uh, that, as, as you all know, there's nothing more uh, important or beneficial to uh, a strong manuf manufacturing sector, to lots of jobs in that sector, than reliable, affordable energy. And so the sudden uh, uh, and likely long-term Step function down in the cost of natural gas. Tremendous, tremendous benefit to many, many businesses in this state and I'm sure in all manufacturing states. Um, and uh, so for that, we have engineers to thank. Um, I enjoyed telling the graduates uh, at Purdue commencement last year that, that uh, this, is the, this is the story of human progress. It's, uh, things don't travel on straight lines, at least not very long. In fact, at sometimes at the moments of, uh, of most doubt and pessimism, there's a breakthrough. It doesn't come from a general. It doesn't come from a, a politician. It consistently comes from a scientist or an engineer. And uh, suddenly, uh, there's a quantum leap. Suddenly, there is a, uh, a whole new set of projections. And this is the best example we've seen in recent years. And uh, I, I enjoyed telling them, you know, that there were some boilermakers involved out there somewhere and devising these new techniques, and that's what boilermakers do. And uh, that's what you do. That's how you became members of the academy or came to the positions you hold now. And we're just very grateful for you. Now, um, other times when we're together, you can help me understand ways in which and these things can cut both ways. Um, the very breakthroughs the very ingenuity of great modern engineering brings with it automation. Brings with it, I mean, there's a, what's happening in robotics, I can't possibly as a layman keep up with, but it's uh, each, each uh, time I encounter it, it's, somebody, it's gone further and faster. Um, good and bad news. You know, good news, a lot of manufacturers I talk to are having big second thoughts or even acting on them and bringing work home from somewhere that had a cheaper labor environment. Not so good news. One reason they can do that is they don't need much labor when they get here. So it's no longer what the, the cost, the part of their cost structure that, that sent them to China or Mexico in the first place is no longer that big an issue. Um, what's, what's, where's that lead? I mean, it, it has to lead, I guess, to where it always has. It's the next invention, the next industry no one saw coming, the next new set of products. And uh, to those of you in this room who've built your careers doing that, uh, we all owe you so much. Um, uh, all we can ask uh, now is that you don't stop because your, your, uh, your ingenuity, uh, your engineering skill, uh, your imagination to, uh, to, to uh, solve problems people think are insoluble, uh, to create new goods and services no one ever asked for because they hadn't thought of them yet. Uh, we never needed it more. Thank you so much and welcome to Purdue.
only thing I would add to that is instead of make it as a measure, we should, it should be makers as a measure, boiler makers. So there we are. Perhaps we've coined a new term today. Now, we have a, a very interesting opportunity this afternoon because some of you may know that uh, the network, the National Network of Manufacturing Institutes have, have been initiated in this country. I believe uh, we are approaching uh, the first 10 or so that are being discussed. There are several that have been initiated, and we're lucky enough to have one close by uh, who's going to bring us some news about how these manufacturing institutes are going to play out. Are we taking a break? I'm sorry. <laughs> You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it is a break time. We have a break at 2.55, so please, back at 3.05. Thank you, and I'll pick up a second edition. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Can you please join, rejoin your seats, please, so we can start again? Please come rejoin me. Those of you in the aisle, please have a seat. Thank you. Thank you. The, the very, very interesting part of the program is just ahead of us, and uh, I, for one, am looking very much forward to learning more about the national manufacturing institutes that are being founded around the country. I gave you a little bit of a preamble of that, that before break, and I apologize for having turned over the program and missed the break, so forgive me for that, but uh, that won't happen again. <laughs> there are no more breaks. <laughs> <laughs> um, this afternoon we have with us uh, Dean Bartles, who is the Executive Director of the Digital Manufacturing and Design Innovation Institute, uh, located just to our west uh, in Illinois. and. Uh, Dan, Dean comes to us, he's the executive director there, uh, it, within what is called UI Labs, and we'll let him explain exactly what UI Labs is, but I, my understanding is it's a, it's a modern version of uh, one of the applied research laboratories that uh, many universities developed, uh, at, at, for example, at MIT and, and, uh, and other institutions, and that, that some of the other universities like Purdue and, and Illinois did not have, uh, and uh, these were World War II legacies in many ways. The modern legacy is, is uh, the modern incarnation of that is, is typical of what's happening in Illinois, and uh, I'm anxious to hear more about it. Dean has more than 35 years of management experience. He's been at Fairchild Republic, General, De General Defense Corporation, uh, the Olin Ordnance, Primex Technologies and General Dynamics Corporation. So he brings this very interesting both leadership and industrial perspective. And he, he serves also currently as Vice President of the Society of Manufacturing Engineering, SME, the central uh, organizational structure that represents manufacturing today in this country. And he's going to uh, speak with us on a topic which, as I said, uh, deals with the National Manufacturing Institute's his particular version of that is, ex is exactly what he's going to speak to this afternoon. So I'll turn the floor to him at this time, and I'm delighted that you could come to uh, join us today. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. I was quite pleased when my friend Dr. Sutherland called me and said that the dean would like me to have come here to address this audience, especially this audience. Really happy to be here. Uh, a little bit about UI Labs. It's a brand new not-for-profit company that was formed. Um, a lot of people think UI stands for University of Illinois. That's not accurate. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I think, I think it might have started that way, but uh, you, you, the U and the I, really, they're, they're saying represents universities and industries. It's a, it's a collaboration that uh, we're, we're trying to do. It's, a, like I said, it's brand new. Um, as of April the 1st, there were no employees, uh, so we now have three, and uh, <laughs> uh, we're, we're staffing up. 
um, should have a, hopefully about a dozen or so within the next six months. Uh, so along with uh, starting up a new institute, starting up a new company, it's a, it's a little bit challenging. I spent 35 years working for a rather large corporation um, and was happy to take this opportunity. This is a lot different than what I've done during my career, but it was just one of those real exciting opportunities that you couldn't pass up when I got, got the call and asked if I would consider doing this. So I'm really happy to be on board. A lot of my family and friends think I've lost my mind. I'm moving from Clearwater, Florida to Chicago, Illinois, and I did that decision during the winter. Um, but uh, yes, this winter too, exactly. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the Digital Manufacturing and Design Innovation Institute. It is a major initiative. As, as you heard previously, uh, the current administration would like to set up a national network of manufacturing innovation institutes. Uh, so far, the president has moved without any congressional uh, laws being passed to set up the first four. Uh, the very, very first one, uh, some of you may know, was set up about two years ago in Youngstown, Ohio. It's called the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Institute. It focuses on 3D printing. Uh, they were a pilot institute, so it did not receive the full funding that they have slated for the institutes that they want to create. So it received about $35 million in federal funding. And the winning team, which you have to be a not-for-profit to bid on these institutes, you have to bring a team of companies and universities and state and local governments that are willing to match the federal government's X million dollars, whatever they're putting up. Uh, so I believe they're up to about $45 million of federal funding now. Uh, they're still working towards becoming a full-fledged, fully funded institute. Um, but that program was won by the National Center for Defense Manufacturing and Machining, a small $10 million a year at the time, not-for-profit in Blairsville, Pennsylvania. So then earlier this year, in January, the president announced the second institute. It's focused on something that I'm sure most of you in this room will know a lot more about than I do. It's called semiconductor wideband gap technology. As I understand it, it's semiconductors that will use a lot less energy and uh, make all of our appliances use less energy and all of our uh, battery-driven devices last a lot longer. So it's pretty, pretty cool technology. It was won by a group led by North Carolina State. The president went down to Raleigh, North Carolina to make that announcement. It was televised nationally. Uh, it was pretty exciting. And then uh, I believe it was on February, don't hold me to this exact day, but I think it was around the 23rd, 24th, somewhere in there, I can't remember now. Uh, the president had another press conference. Uh, it was actually in the White House to announce the two additional institutes. Uh, one of them was uh, called the Lightweight Modern Metals Manufacturing Innovation Institute. That was won by a team led by Edison Welding Institute and the University of Michigan. And they, were, uh, they had advertised they're, they're going to put that location, uh, the central location of that institute in Canton, Michigan. Uh, and then the second one uh, announced the same day was the one that I'm involved with, the Digital Manufacturing and Design Innovation Institute led by UI Labs. Uh, but again, even though it's led by UI Labs, the, the way they won is because they had a very large team of companies and universities, uh, of which Purdue is one of, I'm happy to say. Um, and they pledged uh, ab about a $105 million match to the U.S. government, $70 million, but they really had approximately $250 million of match from both cash as well as cash equivalent and in-kind pledges from the various companies and universities. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> So the $320 million is the number that I talked about, the 250 matching the federal government's $70 million. More than 315 local, regional, and national organizations. So I had nothing to do, I want to say, I had nothing to do with the team uh, that was organized in the proposal process that, uh, that won this particular institute. Uh, they called me pretty much after the proposal was mostly in the can and asked me if I would consider being the executive director if they won. Um, so that was my great contribution to the proposal effort. My name went in as the executive director. 500 plus supporting companies, world class leaders in defense and commercial manufacturing. They, they received a lot of letters of support. And a lot of these companies that gave uh, the Chicago team a letter of support also gave the other four teams that bid on this letters of support. So it wasn't, you know, ev everyone was very interested in this particular institute. And a lot of the companies that were teamed with the Chicago team were also teamed with some of the other teams that were bidding on this. So there were four other competing groups, one located in Huntsville, Alabama, one in Boston, Massachusetts, one in California, and one in Charlotte. 
Um, so I've already reached out to those four teams and asked them if they'd be interested in getting together with us and perhaps brainstorming and collaborating what, how we could work together with their partners that they had on their teams. Some of their partners are already on our team, um, but if they've got other ideas on how we could brainstorm, how we could collaborate and expand the relationships in those four areas as well. So we have over 40 industry partners now, 30 plus academic government and community partners, 23 of uh, universities altogether, and 12 of those 23 have pledged $10 million or more of in-kind support for the projects that we anticipate doing during, during the five years. So what was the goal of these institutes? Uh, creating this innovative ecosystem. So we, we're, we're trying to take digital manufacturing technologies uh, and a lot of people talk about, you know, things in the technical readiness level of 6.4 uh, to 6.7. Some people refer to that as the valley of death, where these great ideas that are developed in the 6.1 through 6.3 really takes, takes a, a lot of time, a lot of effort to get them into more mature phases and get them to adapted by industry. So that's going to be one of the goals of all the institutes, actually, is to focus on that 6.4 to 6.7 TRL level. Commercializing the research. Uh, if we don't figure out a way to have these institutes self-sustaining at the end of five years, we've failed. It is the number one metric that the government is looking to measure us on. So one of the ways uh, that the institutes are focusing on how to do that is by commercializing the research. Um, a big part of this effort is going to be workforce development and training. The facility that we'll, we'll be building in Chicago on Goose Island, if uh, any of you are familiar with Goose Island, I believe there's a beverage that was, has that name as well. Uh, but that it's, it's actually an island that's right in the middle of the river, very, very, very close to downtown Chicago, about one mile west of Magnificent Mile. Uh, that facility will have uh, not only state-of-the-art uh, technology demonstration capabilities for digital manufacturing, but will also have a training facility. There'll be a, a training room that will be able to have classes uh, up to, let's say, about 100 students at a time. Uh, lots of ideation spaces, uh, so a lot of opportunity for collaboration for small and medium manufacturers to work with some of the larger manufacturers, actually come into the facility and work on projects over uh, you know, a period of time. Uh, so altogether, we're looking at probably putting in about $15 million of, of uh, state and local money towards building out that facility in Chicago. Hope to break, hope to cut ribbon, let's say, in about nine to ten months is our goal. Um, strengthening the U.S. economy, uh, there's been a lot of analysis done, uh, you know, by the people that do those kinds of analyses that talk about how much impact these institutes will have on the economy. Um, you can see our partners uh, there on the, on the left-hand side, the first six listed there, GE, Rolls-Royce, Procter & Gamble, Dow, Siemens, and Lockheed Martin, are all Tier 1 partners. Each of them have pledged $2 million of cash over the first five years, as well as $3 million of in-kind towards the projects that we'll do over the first five years. Uh, some of the tier two partners are listed there. They, they've pledged a million dollars of cash over the first five years. The universities that you see listed there are the ones that have pledged $10 million or more. And as I mentioned, we also have some state and local governments uh, that are supporting with cash of $5 million or more. So Illinois, uh, Kentucky, Colorado, and we uh, are very, very close to getting this stood up. Um, we, we've been uh, forming and storming and getting people uh, to coordinate the articles of collaboration, the IP policy. Uh, we will be standing up what we're calling a provisional executive board here in the next two weeks and a provisional technical advisory committee that will be the committee that will decide what the technology roadmap is going to be, what project calls we're going to have, what will be the focus areas of the research. Uh, so every university that pledged $10 million or more will have a seat on the Technical Advisory Committee. Um, of course, the Tier 1 and Tier 2 industry partners will have seats on the Technical Advisory Committee. But there'll be opportunities for the small and medium manufacturers as well to join the Institute and be able to take advantage of these technologies. So if we, if we can't roll these technologies out to the small and medium guys, then we've also failed. And the, and the big guys, quite frankly, uh, they're focused on that. It's a big part of the reason they're joining is because of the supply chain. And how do we get some of the smaller suppliers that are part of that supply chain adopting some of these newer technologies. So three focus areas. 
Advanced Manufacturing Enterprise. Um, you could Google Advanced Manufacturing Enterprise. You'll find a report that was done two years ago by Air Force Research Laboratory. It's about two inches thick. It talks about the digital thread. Some people refer to it as the di digital tapestry. But the idea of taking this, you know, the, the digital design that all of you are used to, uh, that's been around for a long time, but how do we build that model and incorporate all aspects of manufacturing that product into that model as well and have that flow not only from the design phase all the way through manufacturing, all the way through use and end of life. So that's a big part of, what, of the research area that we're going to be doing. Intelligent machining. How do we you know, get more sensing technology on machines and have that data streaming to the cloud and have people, really smart people like those of you in this room, analyzing that data, trending that data, and figuring out how could we make manufacturing more efficient, using less energy, um, and, and overall make our products cheaper, more competitive in the world marketplace. Advanced analysis, uh, you heard earlier mention of you know, finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics, things that we, can, we would like to be able to do simultaneously with design that we can analyze whether or not we can make the product more efficiently or perhaps less expensively or perhaps using less energy. So all that type of analysis will be a big part of the research agenda for the Institute. Open source platform, General Electric has developed a platform that they've uh, spent tens of millions of dollars developing over the last several years. I think most of us have seen the commercials on television about how they're using some of that technology with their products, getting data off of their jet engines, getting data off of their trains. Uh, they have brought that platform to the Institute and they are going to make it open source. What that will allow us to do will all the small and medium manufacturers, for example, will be able to access that platform. We, we imagine, we hope, that uh, through the help of the really smart people like you that will be working on, these, on this research, uh, that we'll be able to have collaboration happening simultaneously no matter where someone's located. So imagine 20 subcontractors simultaneously logging into that digital model, being able to look at how their part interfaces with the rest of the parts, what kind of adjustments could be made to make it more efficient. All that will be accessible through the digital manufacturing commons, which is the term given to this platform. Uh, the, ho the hub and spoke model, you heard earlier a presenter talk about the, uh, I, I believe it was called the NMAC, if I said that right. Um, and fascinating, the, the alignment of the, of the research areas for NMAC with the institute that I'm involved in. So uh, certainly would like to figure out how we can better collaborate on that. Uh, but, there, but the idea is to have not just the Digital Manufacturing Institute Laboratory in Chicago on Goose Island, but to have these hubs created in, in all the partner communities so that all, any technology that we develop, uh, part of the responsibility is to also develop the curriculum content that will be able to flow out to small and medium manufacturers and to the, to the community colleges, to the high schools, to the universities so that we can train the future workforce and how to use these technologies. Uh, so that's going to be a big part of it. We can't do it just out of one facility in Chicago. It's going to be this hub and spoke model. Benefits of participation. So you've got the collaboration and the research and the direction setting. If you're a member of the Institute, you have a voice. Um, so you could potentially influence the direction of the research. Um, competitiveness. So I asked the gentleman from Procter & Gamble, you know, what's, what's in this for Procter & Gamble? Um, and clearly, he, he, he's, he was very passionate about his answer and talked about how Procter & Gamble is doing many innovative things with the supply chain and how and some of the issues they're struggling with like all of us are struggling with is our issues that we can all do perhaps better if we collaborate and figure out you know putting all of our resources together can we solve some of those larger problems so being a member will help you align yourself with some of the other large corporations that are struggling with the same kind of problems that everyone struggles with and how can we solve big problems by working together. Access to the intellectual property, it, it, depending on what tier level membership you join at, uh, there are different levels of IP rights. And uh, also, last but not least, uh, this manufacturing ecosystem that I've already talked about for workforce development. Big, big part of what we're going to do uh, is workforce development, education, and training. So here's uh, just a representative sample of the uh, you know, kind of broken down, very, very simple format of the partnership tiers, the levels of investment that you could, you could make with your institution, your organization, and you know, whether you get a board seat or a seat on the technology panel, um, that, that kind of thing. Uh, all this is available in your handouts. I won't go through it in detail. If anyone has any questions about it, please see me at, 
you know, after this thing is over, I'll be happy to hang around for a little while, but it's pretty, pretty straightforward. You'll find most of the institutes are going to have a very similar format. Um, I know that the first one, the 3D printing, uh, they did not have memberships at this kind of financial investment level, uh, but this digital manufacturing space is a different animal. They're, they're really large corporations are very, very interested in, in advancing this research, which is why together they formed this tier structure and how they came up with the kind of financial investments that we're looking at. So uh, I wanted to show you Bill King. That, ignore the guy on the left. But the guy on the right is uh, Professor Bill King from the University of Illinois. He is the chief technology officer, and he was one of the key architects uh, in, in developing the Chicago team's proposal and approach to uh, how the institute would be managed. He could not have done it without the other university partners that were a big part of this. Um, I, I, my friends from Notre Dame are sitting here as well. And, uh, but, but all 23 universities had, had a lot to do with shaping how uh, the, the institute would be run, and uh, they obviously came up with a winning strategy. So with that, I will open the floor for questions. I wanted to save time for questions because I thought maybe a few of you might have some questions, so please. Okay. Um, my email address is in your packet, and um, our website's on there as well. Uh, oh, here's a question. So, so I apologize if that's what I said. So I, all IP is not going to be open, but the Digital Manufacturing Commons, this platform that will, we're going to be using, General Electric brought that in as an open source platform as opposed to a proprietary platform. So the platform will be open source for people to, to join and not have to pay any royalties to use it, that kind of thing. But the IP will not be open source. The IP will be controlled by by the organizations that, that pursue those projects. If the federal government is putting in money, uh, for a given project, which of course they're going to, they have $70 million to spend, uh, it, the government will have government purpose rights for any IP developed under any project that's done through this uh, shared funding. But there'll be opportunities for companies to get together and say, we don't really need any of the federal government money, we'd like to invest some of our money into a project that, that we want to control the IP. Especially if something is fairly sensitive, uh, perhaps even ITAR controlled from an export perspective, uh, there'll be ways to do that as well. So that, the chart that you had that showed tier one members, the far right column said full access, uh, you know, right there, IP rights full. So is that so, the so full, common? Yeah, full, full IP. In other words, if you're a tier one member and, and you, um, you will have full IP rights to any project that your tier one company is involved with, there's all, the, the, the IP policy oh, itself. I mean, no, no, no. You, you won't have to. Yes, no, if you're a tier one, you won't have to. Yeah, the, the, the other one's Mike. That's correct. Okay, I got yeah, it. and all that to, uh, is still sort of in the development phase. Uh, we we have to wrestle all of that with all of our members here in the next 60 days and come up with an IP policy that everyone, hopefully, well, let's say at least the majority can accept. There is not, yes. Is the funding available to everybody for application or is it restricted to the members? So in order to participate in a project, you would either have to be a member or be on a member's team. So you can become a member without investing um, much in the way of cash. We expect to be able to open this to small and medium manufacturers for a very nominal fee. Again, the executive board will decide what that fee is, but in my mind, it's going to be something maybe $1,000. Um, the the uh, America Makes, which is the Additive Manufacturing Innovation Institute, their minimum investment's 15000 We felt that was a little high for some of the small mediums, so we're going to try to keep it to a fairly low level. But you could, you could as, a, as a member, you can certainly bid on any project call, um, but you could also join a team if you're not a member. You know, if you have a certain technology or a certain skill that one of the teams is, is interested in, there's, a way to, there's still a way to participate. Yeah? So the, the executive board going to come up with research directions or thrust areas? So, Yes, yes. So the, the way we're going to do that is the technical advisory committee, okay, which is made up of representatives from Tier 1, Tier 2, all the universities will have a, um, a representative, and, and they will decide on the technology roadmap, finalizing the technology roadmap, where, and what are the gaps in that technology roadmap. Those gaps will become the basis of the project calls. 
So yes, there'll be project calls where we'll invite everyone that's a member to, to come and hear those project calls, ask questions, so forth, and have about 60 days then to propose their project ideas. They'll, you know, each, each proposal will, will come in with you know, some kind of a one-to-one -one match uh, as, as part of that, and if you, if you want federal government funding. That, that's, that's, and that's kind of the model that all the institutes are using. Yeah? You mentioned uh, a structure where if there's a group focused on kind of technology that the institute helps bring that group together and be able to maintain those IT rights for you know, the group's benefit. Is that what I'm hearing? Or? Yeah, I mean, if there's, so, so if there's a special project area of a technology that a couple of companies, um, for example, let's say a couple of aerospace companies wanted to develop a certain technology that they could share. Uh, they have the right to pull their resources together without federal government funding and work on just that project just amongst them. You know, so that, that's a, a, a unique way of doing some of the research, but the majority of the research will be more collaborative where all the members will have access to it. But there is a way to do that. Yes, ma'am. So with the standing up of the provisional executive board here in the next two weeks and the provisional technical advisory committee, hopefully also in the next two weeks, we hope to have the first project call in approximately 45 days. Yeah. So the idea of standing up these provisional boards uh, allows us to do that, but we won't be able to award any projects until we have the membership agreement completely agreed to and executed by each of the partners. But, so we'll do that in parallel, and, and that'll help us shorten the time frame about 90 days, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for answering some questions that uh, were clearly on the minds of lots of us as to how this is going to operate. There are I think there's an intention for, as, as the government has said, as the uh, current uh, government has said, that uh, there will be many more of these. And of course, there is currently one in, gate, in development now in, in the composites field, and I'm spending some time on that. So I was particularly interested in answers to those questions uh, myself. Now let me turn the subject to an innovator, a person who took some ideas uh, in science and technology, and is now building a business around them, a person whom I know quite well because she was at one time a student who worked with me at the University of Delaware, uh, and now, after some very successful years in the academic world, has moved on uh, to form her own company uh, in, the, in the area of battery uh, technology. This is Anne-Marie Sastry. Uh, I was pleased to read a small uh, write-up from her, and one of the uh, particularly interesting facts to me is that she has 70 awarded or filed patents. Um, that's, a, that's an extraordinary number, I think, for a person of any character, but someone who also was at the same time carrying on a very substantial research program at the University of Michigan. She held the author F. Thermo, Therno professorship in, of engineering there in, in mechanical engineering and was uh, tenured. Her laboratory originated the technical work that underpins this, uh, this work she's going to be talking about, and her company's name is SACTI3. But just a few more things about Anne Marie. Uh, she won the 2011, she won the ASME Frank Creeth Energy Award. Um, in 2007, the ASME Gustav Larson Award, uh, and she holds PhD and MS degrees from Cornell University, and I must tell you, bachelor's degree at the University of Delaware, where she and I worked together for four years. So, Anne Marie, I turn the podium to you. Well, it's an honor to be here. I, uh, I double-checked my slides, having once worked for Byron Pipes. <laughs> and uh, it's just really a thrill to be your colleague now after all these years, so thank you very much. And it's been uh, marvelous to listen to the talks this morning. 
I'm going to talk about batteries, which is kind of a prosaic subject, but hopefully uh, you'll get some of the enthusiasm that my teams and I have had for it because it affects so many things. Many, many uh, enabling technologies from batteries. By sector, in consumer electronics, the battery cells that are in your laptops are really fundamentally not different from the battery cells that drive hybrid and electric vehicles or the battery cells that drive grid power installations. The next generation will probably be wearables. How many people have a wearable technology on right now? Anybody? All the engineers raise their hands probably. Uh, okay. And those are little versions of the same kinds of batteries that are in the larger consumer electronics and auto and grid. They're wound configurations of particle technologies that are mixed in large industrial mixers, uh, laid out on conveyor belts, run through slot die or doctor blade processes, uh, compressed and then wound and formed a shape. Higher energy density and higher power density are needed for all of these technologies. So right now, there are a number of things that people would like to put into wearables technologies that they can't because battery cells don't have enough energy and power density. In automotive, we all know this, hybrids are fairly common now. Toyota is the big winner in the hybrid market. There's a modest production of EVs. Tomorrow, I think many of us hope to see large scale production of electric vehicles. And the simple answer is that it's cost. The simple answer is that battery cells right now are too expensive. In a Volt battery, for example, costs about $15,000, and that's fairly typical. A full battery electric vehicle, the power pack goes 15 to 30K, which really is an overwhelming price differential over an IC engine. So not only higher energy density, which is range that we talk so much about, but in electric vehicles, cost is really a big, a big factor. In grid power, today, there are demonstration prog programs on microgrids, so projects which combine wind power, solar power, uh, battery cell technology, some liquid flow batteries, some uh, compressed air, but mostly small. As more or less an applied mathematician, uh, my teams and I are very fascinated by this because the idea of optimizing energy on a system is almost too good to pass up. But what, right now, one of the stumbling blocks is really, or one of the barriers is really energy. Uh, st energy storage. Next, in smart grids, we hope to see larger installations. And of course, again, we see cost being a big issue and higher energy density. So when you combine all of these things, you have energy density, power density, and cost being the big three. I want to start a little bit talking about how batteries work just to orient everybody who may not spend every day thinking about batteries like mostly I do, but this is a discharge. Uh, and during discharge, uh, in a lithium battery, lithium ions travel from the anode to the cathode. Uh, that is a spontaneous reaction. During charge, the process is reversed. A very short version of the battery story is that it really is all about cathodes for lithium batteries. And these are some of the common cathode technologies. This table actually represents a huge global production in battery cells ranging from everything that might be in your wristwatch all the way to uh, battery standby power for an electrical grid. So this is really this is really the toolkit today. And battery cells made out of these materials are essentially made the same way. As I mentioned, they're made out of uh, small particles that are mixed in large industrial mixtures and laid out and rolled into prismatic and sometimes cylindrical configuration. The 18650 battery, which is a battery that's 18 millimeters on diameter and 65 millimeters long, is sort of the industry standard. And a lot of the data that I'll show you in models really are on the 18650 because it's such a ubiquitous cell. There are over 18 steps for porous laminate electro batteries today. And for anybody in the audience who really, uh, there are so many of you who really understand manufacturing, 60 days of whip, 60 days of whip work in progress, which is a killer. And so when you think about dismantling the cost out of these manufacturing systems, you really have to address that. The reason for that whip is a scientific reason. The reason for that whip is formation is required. So the formation of a thin layer around all of the minuscule particles inside the battery, normally around 10 microns in diameter, have to grow a surface layer. And that takes time. A lot of companies have their special secret sauce, a, a protocol for charging the battery cells and discharging them to encourage the growth of that formation. But if you continue to stay on this technology, no one else uh, right now has figured out how to get that whip out, how to get that SEI layer formation out, and many have tried. It appears to be a, an intrinsic part of the electrochemistry. There is a, a very um, complicated step 
kinetic steps required to growing that layer, and they have to do with cathode electrolyte uh, interactions. And so the intrinsic nature of this technology with liquid electrolytes, solid particles in the anode and cathode, and ceramic dip polymer separators in the battery cells really leads to this. The depreciation is large. These factories are, um, like all mature technologies, really bought by the pound. And so moving equipment is really the major part of it. And I'll show you some bar charts of what the bomb looks like and what the cogs look like. But very difficult to get the cost out of these systems. Um, this essentially is very similar to paper making processes, which we've been doing as human beings for 3,000 years. Of course, much more advanced than that, but the bottom line is that it's very difficult to get the cost out of this uh, mature technology. And then, of course, the battery costs run 300 to 800 bucks or so per kilowatt hour, 300 being the sort of mid range consumer electronic, and 800 being a high end automotive cell. In total, about $12 billion in uh, the total addressable market in battery cells. And it's really carved up among some major players, again, that make battery cells about the same way. Uh, a bar chart is shown on the left with the contributions of industrial, automotive, and consumer. And forecasts uh, uniformly, generically, have automotive being a bigger piece of the pie. Of course, those markets haven't shown up yet, and I'll talk a little bit about why. But Samsung, Sanyo, LG, and Sony really carve up most of the world. And interestingly, the big players today in the battery market, probably unsurprisingly, are both manufacturers of battery cells and consumers of battery cells. So they have a consumer electronics business or an auto business and also uh, a battery business, which makes a lot of sense. That helps ride the bumps. There are some limitations in cost and performance. Uh, and I wouldn't be a former professor if I didn't show some uh, SEMs and show some <laughs> equations, so I apologize for these. But they really do sort of explain what's going on, right? These particles are 10 microns or so. And even during the manufacturing process, uh, faults are introduced. So the, ba the battery particles split up. As I explained in the solid electrolyte interface layer, what happens is that also breaks that interface layer, exposes new surface area. So it's a really tricky problem. Also, intercalation stresses, when the lithium moves from the anode to the cathode in a battery cell, it swells the particles, and that also leads to another stress. Chemical degradation is also a factor, and so uh, how many of you have uh, seen your lead acid, re lead acid battery vent? I'm dating myself when I say it. Yeah, okay, so, or added water to a battery ever? Yeah, and so, okay, <laughs> a lot of hands go up. This is a very august uh, uh, crowd. Um, <coughs> They're liquids, and they not only vent, they react with the particles, and they degrade. And part of the trick is to get batteries to work at low temperature, get very high diffusivity through these liquids without blowing up. And that leads to a very complicated uh, mechanophysiochemical problem. We worked on this problem for a long time, and I want to uh, mention some of my many collaborators, Professor Wei Lu at University of Michigan and Professor Wei Shi, who's now provost at HKUST. Of course, uh, the uh, great Professor Christian Lostowski, whose um, minor credential is that he's my husband, his major credential is that he's a very uh, fine chemical engineering uh, <laughs> professor, and he's also uh, head of the program in uh, environmental engineering at the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. John Hin Park and a cast of many others from government laboratories and universities and so forth. And I had the honor of running the, uh, a large battery center at Michigan when I was a professor there. So we worked on this problem for a long time. We worked on this lamination problem. And of course, coming from where I'm visiting from today, Michigan, uh, the reasons are probably obvious. We had a large center with General Motors, and we were working on trying to improve this lamination technology. And we built a lot of models. So we built models for what was happening at these interfaces. We built models for dissolution, SEI morphology evolution, and gas generation. And we put them together in optimization frameworks so we could understand how these effects uh, balanced out. And perhaps there was a way to find a sweet spot in terms of volume fraction, particle size, chemical properties, physical properties, so that we could kind of burst through some of these barriers, uh, so to speak. Uh, we didn't, really. We were probably, with a lot of other researchers around the world who've been working on this problem for a while, uh, the S-curve that John showed earlier, that John Wall showed earlier, is really, uh, this is an example of that, right? We see this in battery cells as well. And of course, we've seen improvements in performance, and doubtless there'll be more improvements, but it is asymptoting, right? So, and it's a complex uh, physical problem. The bill of materials, meanwhile, uh, is almost 
uh, it was very heavily dominated by the cathode. So the cathode cost is a substantial part of the battery, and those cathodes uh, are among the, the members of the table that I showed you earlier. So the rest of the cell, uh, you know, less than uh, 80 cents or so. Now let's look at the cost of goods sold. So we, we tend to look at things kind of mathematically, right, for obvious reasons. And we looked at the ratio of the bill of materials to the cost of goods sold, cost of goods sold because that gives you an idea of how much improvement you can make in the total cost by excellence of manufacturing. So if your materials cost is a really large fraction of your COGS, uh, your opportunity to improve your cost situation with excellence in manufacturing is maybe not so great. If it's a smaller fraction, you're in pretty good shape. If you compare the U.S. and China, and these are under similar assumptions, this is a study by Ralph Broad, uh, who's a well-known figure in the field and a friend, uh, uh, between U.S. and China, they're actually not that different, right? And so the thinking has been, well, everybody races to manufacturing where the low-cost labor markets are. But really, if you've toured a fab, I see some people are nodding no. If you've toured a fab recently in Asia, you see excellence. You see excellence in manufacturing. The notion that um, you know, it's, it's really only about labor costs is not, not exactly true. In fact, a lot of the supply chain has moved to Asia for this kind of processing. And so with automation and with improvements and in, in, in throughput, the labor part of the equation is actually much lower now than it was, meaning that the differential between the U.S. and China is actually not that great. The bottom line, though, the bomb to COGS ratio is 74 percent in the U.S. and 81 percent in China. Your opportunity to improve your cost situation with improvements in manufacturing is maybe not super great. This is the previous slide was for 35 million cells per year. So then one question might be, well, if we kick out a lot more cells per year, then how much better are we doing? And the answer is not great. Uh, the bomb to COGS ratio is about the same. So even for 10 lines at once, uh, you don't have a, a huge opportunity to make up some of the costs and scale. And that's what we're seeing globally right now. So what have we seen? Well, on the supply side, Stimuli, anticipated mar markets have produced uh, overcapacity in lamination technology. On the demand side, uh, EV markets are unrealized as yet. The smaller CE cells, which will be SACD3's first markets, uh, absolutely dominate. The limitations are that safety issues limit uh, use, but more importantly, necessitate complex systems, which are expensive and add expense. So the upshot is that we felt that there was a new development path needed. So we looked at the available toolkit, and we thought about the best way to build a battery if you could do it at low cost. There are a lot of choices of materials, and these um, nano flowers, nano pillars, nano disks, and very interesting uh, different architectures. We started to think about this in a relatively simple way. So if you just look at 1D and 2D and 3D systems, the question we asked was, if we do a thought experiment on how you would line up cathode materials, what would those materials look like? If you just look at the dependent, uh, dimension dependent capacity per cube, the obvious thing to do is to build everything out of spheres, right? Build everything out of spheres, you have a high surface area to volume ratio, and you can fill it with some material that's very diffusive, move all the ions close to your particles, and have a really good battery. Except that that's not the whole story. If you compress all the material into a thin film, you actually, of course, hit the theoretical limit for active material in the cell. So if you eliminate all the little particles and you actually can diffuse all the lithium onto the other side of the battery, you've really got something. If your diffusivity is really high, you've really got something. So we started to think about how could you design materials that would enable you to do all solid state processing? How could you do things to get the liquid out of a battery? We weren't the first to think about this. There were others, of course, uh, and the field is about 24 years old or so, uh, who were working at national labs with a cobalt oxide technology, but it was really expensive. And so some of the techniques that people were using to make thin film batteries were intrinsically expensive. Atomic layer deposition, RF sputtering, uh, pulse laser deposition, reject, reject, reject from our point of view, because it's very, very difficult to ride the cost curve. The energy per centimeter squared, whatever metric you, you would think of to use in vacuum would just kill you by the time you were even in a consumer electronic battery, much less a car. And these are some of the companies that worked on that. So that S curve is shown. 
uh, we projected that those technologies would, would be well below even the, the uh, incumbent technology. So we started to write some codes. And we got some great investors. Coastal Ventures, Barangia, GM Ventures, and Itochu joined in and supported the company. And we build a new suite of computational tools, starting with the multi-physics model, going all the way up to everything from optimizing a plant. And the reason that I think this is kind of an interesting day for me to hear all of the uh, manufacturing experts is we really started thinking all the way out there. Because until you can build a plant that's efficient, you can't design the right material. So the challenging part for us was to get all these pieces of codes to work together at every step. And I lead a great, uh, great team at SACTI3, uh, principal investigators, you know, Chai Wei Wong, Sean Tren Zhang, Gen Hung Chen, uh, Myung Do Chung, and Hyun Chao Kim, uh, my great colleagues there. And we worked together to put together data and experiments that would fill in this chart. In R&D and commercial, uh, these codes exist, but of course they didn't work together. So we built a complete set of tools designed for analysis of thin film batteries so that we could go back and forth across scales and check at every iteration what the cost of the battery cell would be because we knew approximately what the plant would look like. We built cell performance, optimization, state of charge, optimization plant optimization, battery cost forecasting, up to and including life cycle analysis. And uh, our great partner, uh, Professor Christian Lestosky, has done that work uh, for us and in collaboration with us so that we would understand what the impact of our battery materials is going to be because this is going to be a lot of batteries. We projected very big numbers. So today's battery cells hover around six to 700, 700 being a very good day at the office, watt hour per liter. We projected a real disruption by making these materials. We optimized, and then we made them. And so these are just two movies. At left, you see one of our battery cells on test, and the engineer has broken the battery cell, and it keeps cycling. And the battery cell on right has been dipped in a jar of water, which I don't recommend doing with your, with your current batteries. Please don't do that. Um, the voltage briefly drops because the leads short to each other in the water. The battery cell is pulled out, it dries off, and it recovers its potential. You can do really unique things with this technology. It's intrinsically very safe. You can break it in half and it keeps cycling. You can dip it in water. And the reason is it's all solid state construction. So this was the projection for the prior thin film. And this is where we are today. So today, we've demonstrated uh, over 1,000 watt hour per liter. We project in the marketplace. Our Gen 1 technology will be somewhat above that. And we project that we'll be on a development path to double that. Again, the S-curve means that you have to jump technologies. And so manufacturing has always been a really important, intrinsic part of all of our, our calculus. The performance we've demonstrated so far, as I said, 1,030 watt hour per liter, uh, 440 watt hour per kilogram, pretty impressive numbers. With advanced simulation, we can actually optimize these thin layers so that you get rid of inactive materials in the battery cell. SEI formation is not an issue, and most importantly, this technology can drop into an existing uh, manufacturing approach. We need to make these cheaply. So our process methodology is a vacuum processing approach, and this is just a little cartoonish um, description of that. These already exist. Large area, glass coating, solar cells, big screen TVs. Who has a big screen TV? We hope to put a battery on the back of that someday. Uh, there are a large number of industries that actually do high throughput thin film processing. And our approaches, the approaches we developed, are amenable to that kind of processing, up to and including food packaging, everything including uh, bread wrappers made in similar ways. So the device methodology is to stack the battery cells. And the manufacturing advantage is pretty big. We go from 18 steps to nine, zero days in formation and aging, uh, much lower depreciation, and out the door pricing of 390 watt hours per kilogram. And we have a roadmap. So again, with simulation, starting with physics, going all the way through a plant, we know that we can methodically get the cost out of these cells. And we'll work on the right par parameters to get the cost out. 
This is for consumer electronics. We uh, project being able to get under 100 bucks per kilowatt hour. In automotive and grid, a similar story. Um, the capex in each case is different because the battery sizes are different. So for consumer electronics, we might think about a 15 to $25 million line. For auto and grid, maybe a $60 million line. How fast can we scale it? Pretty fast if the manufacturing platform is similar. There, um, everybody complains about batteries, which you know is good when you work for a battery company, but everybody complains about batteries. And the notional thinking has been, well, batteries haven't improved at all, and that's actually not true. The lithium cobalt oxide in 31 years scaled globally and uh, has nearly overwhelmingly replace metal hydride and ICAD technology, which were the generation uh, before. Lithium iron phosphate, 16 years, 1996 to 2012. This is where it went. Nickel cobalt aluminum compounds, uh, just a few years. And NMC in only 12 years. And the reason, uh, the fundamental reason, is probably that the manufacturing base already existed. The supply chain already existed. And so it's not as if everybody who introduced a material change had to build a completely different kind of plant. And so we think the same thing will be true for solid state batteries. Integration is a big issue, how you integrate the company. We have looked a lot at how other battery companies have done it, their verticals and horizontals. And the reality is across all of the horizontals, across all these horizontal lines, it's basically the same battery. Of course, the quality control is higher. Of course, the systems around the battery cells are more complex for more aggressive uh, environments. But the reality is the same plant can kick out a battery cell uh, for multiple markets. BYD is vertically integrated. Hitachi is both vertically and horizontally integrated. But those are battery companies. The choices are actually broader if the foundries already exist. So we like looking at chips. ARM is an interesting model. They license their designs. They have 20 or 30 key mobile licensees, and they rely on spontaneous orders. They're never overcapacitized because they're fabulous. And actually, if you look at the chip industry, which is not dissimilar to our processing approach, Intel manufacturers across uh, have rather narrow profit margins. AMD and NVIDIA both have different models where they capture both the design and the sales part of the businesses, and ARM does design. So the discussion today about the importance of design and R&D and manufacturing is actually reflected in the business world today. There are many models if the foundries exist, if there is a common toolkit in manufacturing. The markets actually are dominated by companies with these creative business models. So the markets for chips are dominated by the flexible companies that can, at a glance, at a decision, switch their manufacturing based on what the customer wants. So for us, we believe that fast scaling is possible. Thin film manufacturing base is already established across several industries. For the first time, foundries already exist for battery cells, as they did in other industries. And solar was a big piece of that, the scale up of solar as all technologists, we stand on the shoulders of the people who worked before us. And solar technologists, every, everybody who worked in everything from solar technologies, large area glass coating, to bread wrappers has invented the technology that we use today. So that's very thrilling. Mass customization is possible. Use of low cost substrates enables multiple kinds of batteries or SKUs on the same production line. And so we envision the same plant being uh, kicking out battery cells across number of different applications. We use masking technology, which is very fungible, so it can do that right away. You can change all the masks in a plant in an hour. Uh, optimization of manufacturing will yield improvements for years to come. Our bomb to COGS ratio today is about 50%, so the opportunity for very smart manufacturing people to come in and improve what we've started uh, is quite profound, and we've already benefited from the wisdom of many of our vendors and partners in that. Um, we did the early science and have begun to do uh, higher throughput prototyping on our, on our scalable equipment, uh, but there's still much, much to learn. The challenge is to replace all the batteries on the planet, which is our immodest goal, right? <laughs> uh, 600 million mobile cellular subscriptions and 460 million laptop computers, 90 terawatt hour per year just in the CE businesses. U.S. vehicle fleet, um, I apologize to 
the colleague from Cummins, if you were to remove all of the IC engines from those vehicles and replace them with batteries, it would comprise about 7,600 terawatt hour per year in energy use. And of course, in grid power, which you know, from a mathematical standpoint, we would love to see smart grids get uh, enacted and enabled and see renewables technologies and, and uh, uh, see um, human beings being better able to exploit the energy sources around them, store them seamlessly, and use them efficiently with, uh, with reduced environmental consequences, that's 29,000 terawatt hour per year in energy use. And so it's a big challenge. Uh, it's an honor to work on the problem with the teams I've had the uh, privilege to lead. And I'll just leave you with a couple of our uh, tenets. These are the tenets that my uh, colleagues at the company uh, agreed that are important to us. The first one, continuously develop new technologies that become products and improve people's lives. Uh, I'll close by saying uh, we've learned a great deal from our manufacturing colleagues. I hope that they've learned a couple of things uh, based on our explorations in physics from us. And we hope uh, that working together will bring solid state technology uh, to the marketplace. Thanks very much. A wonderful example of how the student makes the professor look good. <laughs> Thank you, Anne Marie. That was wonderful. We now turn our attention to the GE Aviation and Manufacturing and Sanjay Korea, who is Vice President uh, of the CMC Operations, I believe that stands for Ceramic Matrix Composites, uh, is with us today. And he'll share a few thoughts about uh, GE Aviation uh, activities. Uh, it was announced by our President that GE will establish a manufacturing plant here in Lafayette, and we're thrilled about that and the relationship with uh, GE. Um, Sanjay was Vice President and Managing Director of GE India Technology Center, headquartered in Bangalore, India, uh, and earlier he was a General Manager for Engineering Technologies at help us uh, organize the questions and answers and the like. And uh, do we know who the panel is? I'll just turn it to you. So we're just going to wrap up with, with a panel where we're going to start with one question to the panelists, but really it's an opportunity for, for questions um, about around the theme of, you know, what are the critical factors for um, ensuring manufacturing is, is a robust component of the economy in the med Midwest. And so three of our speakers have, have agreed to be panelists, and so I'm going to invite Dean and Sanjay, who's over there, and John to come up. Their seat's over here. Maybe that's my seat. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> and over here. I'm, once they sit down, I'm going to ask those of you who are over there, can you see them? It's okay, you can see them? Okay, good. So, just, we're going to, we're going to start with the, with, the, with, the, with the one question, which... We can move over here. Yeah, and if you can't see, come on over here. There's empty seats. There's also, you know, beverages and things like that. Um, if you can't see and you'd rather not, you can move to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what will be the single most critical factor in ensuring that manufacturing is a robust component of the economy in the Midwest? We'll start with that and then we'll move on. John's going to start. No, I guess not. All right, I'm not doing this just to suck up to the academic audience here. I, I think it really has got to start with education. I mean, it's, it's something that we've emphasized uh, globally for Cummins as well as locally, partnering uh, with the communities that we work in, uh, Columbus Educational uh, Coalition that Purdue has been part of, uh, and IUPUC and others. But looking at both uh, vocational education to increase the skills of the workers to be able to handle more sophisticated manufacturing machine tools that we have in our, our plants, and also looking at, um, at how we can improve the education of our engineers. So stimulating STEM uh, in the undergraduate curriculum, uh, even in the, uh, down to the, to the kindergarten level with some of the engineering collaboratives uh, we have locally. But I think really trying to cultivate 
uh, technical um, group of skills that spans the vocational as well as uh, into the professional ranks. Uh, we've had a couple of specific initiatives that we've kicked off uh, as Cummins, um, working specifically with communities around the world. So it's uh, in the Midwest as well as in India and China and some of the other places that I showed today. But it's got to start with, with education uh, and then move on from that to the sort of collaboration we were talking about uh, earlier and then I think uh, you know I could have ripped off Sanjay's slide and said and then the investment I think it's both industry and uh, the governments have to be investing appropriately in the educational infrastructure and the communication infrastructure uh, and being able to collaborate around that okay Dean yeah, I mean, I think the collaboration part is a big piece, of course, since I'm, you know, executive director of one of the collaboration institutes, certainly NMAC as well, and how we can partner. Uh, but, but the curriculum content that our university partners are going to develop is, is fundamentally important to that collaboration taking place, and, and, and rolling that curriculum content out to the universities, colleges, and the high schools is, is going to be a, a fundamental part of that platform. Okay, Ms. Sanjay. So I thought I might have an answer, but just to vet it, I asked, so number of my colleagues and, and you know, other folks. Um, as I mentioned, we built a lot of plants recently, so what are criteria we consider? I didn't get back one, I got back three buckets, and I'll quickly summarize those. Um, the buckets are innovation, workforce, and government, which is very resonant with what is, has been said already. In the innovation, it's a continued investment. Uh, we, we see that where our businesses that invest uh, do well, in the market and those that don't eventually don't do well in the market. We used to be a huge plastics player and we ended up selling that business some 50 years after. From, from 1950s to you know, 2000s, 50 years later, we sold our plastics business with Lexan and a whole bunch of stuff and there's a very correlated story of patents running out and no new innovation, right? Um, a robust ecosystem including you know, uh, subject matter experts and small companies and so on. and I didn't even know you were here. And bringing hardware and software together to completely change old manufacturing paradigms, which I think is a page out of your playbook. Mm. On the workforce side, skills and training, universities. Uh, quality of life, uh, pretty important. Uh, when we were building a research center in Germany, the German government really wanted us to go to places like Magdeburg and so forth in the old eastern Germany. We ended up in Munich, which is not the cheapest place to be. But we attract talent from all over the world. Only half the people in our Munich Research Center are actually German. You know, and they just went there because so it's just a, a culture of continuous improvement. And you can imagine some <coughs> cultures that don't have that mindset. So we, you want to go to a place that has that. And there's a number of things around government. Of course, policy, tax, R&D. And again, not necessarily for us, but for the ecosystem around uh, the plants. IP is a huge thing. You want to go to a place where, and in, you know, in most uh, U.S., Western Europe, that's pretty well respected. Um, willingness to partner on incentives. So we come in with a huge bunch of P&E, and we will be in the plant and equipment. And we'll be there for many, many decades, 50, 60, 70, who knows. Um, and, and so, you know, how can we establish a win-win? And um, uh, somebody mentioned low-cost energy. So I, I think you're president. Uh, infrastructure in general, transportation, low-cost energy. The U.S. right now, with cheap natural gas, has what I've read by Europeans uh, to be probably a 30-year advantage over Europe in terms of manufacturing just because the cost of energy is, is low. And in energy-intensive businesses, this will become the place to be. And I think you're going to see you know, more of that. So sorry, not one, but uh, okay. you got a spectrum of opinions there. Okay, so I, I can keep asking questions, but we could also open this up to questions from from you all. I know what my preference would be. Questions? Are there other questions? Rex. Okay. Uh, regarding innovation that you mentioned, uh, how do you take that advantage from universities in the past? Yeah, I, think, I mean, those of you who have been collaborating with Cummins here know that we really look at the research and development as a spectrum from basic research right through product development, and everybody's got the right job to do. As much as we think about doing, we, some of our people think we're doing basic research inside our industrial company, it's, it's not that basic. Uh, and I think having the partnerships 
uh, allow us to access the novel thinking, the deeper technical understanding about some of the fundamentals, physics and chemistry, and, and also to be able to present the problem that we're dealing with in a way that would hopefully allow the researchers that are doing their work to more directly address it. Our job is to do the product development. One of the things I uh, have seen happen in the last 20 years or so is universities have tried to get into the product development mode or product development engineers in a company will try to offload work to a university because their boss won't give them the budget to pay for it. And that's a complete disaster. There is no, the time scale is wrong, the skill set is wrong. And so I think if you look at it as a continuum and work at it that way, it builds some very strong partnerships and a nice flow from basic research into the practical reality. So, so what are the hardest practical things in making that work? Uh, part of it, I think, is just being able to communicate. You've got to have uh, people that are on the industrial side that actually are deep enough experts to understand and be able to interact mm -hmm. with the people in academia. And you also have to realize one of the things we, we also see is, and I get letters weekly, of someone that's had some isolated and very specific insight that's somewhat out of context of the product that thinks that's going to make them the next billionaire. And uh, neglecting to note the fact that there's $500 million of capital investment you have to do to put a new engine into uh, production. And uh, so it's, it's a combination of being able to make that communication, have everyone see their role in it, and sort of being appropriately compensated along the flow and, and building those partnerships. And frankly, I think you know, it, it weeds itself out pretty quickly. Uh, that and we build strong partnerships with universities and with labs within universities that sort of have that mindset and that capability and you know once again that's that's why we spend a lot of time here. You know one of the um, one of the interesting things that that perhaps you all have done and we've been doing in a deep way is is try to learn the business model in Silicon Valley and and so you get a a Commons or a GE which has these you know, hundreds of millions, billions worth of investment in a product. It's a long cycle. It takes us pretty much seven to nine years to come up with a new um, engine. You go deep in the hole before you go positive again, but then you are good. You go deep in the hole with non-recurrent engineering, but then you make about 6x more, 7x more over the next 30 years. So you years. can pay for some more things to go you deep in the hole. Yeah. But, but the very interesting thing is, what is the role of a university, and let's say that's a surrogate for all very advanced thinking, in a, long before there's even the vision of a product, right? And, and then what is the role of the company? Because even in our own research labs, there are lots of ideas that go nowhere. In fact, I would say most of the ideas go nowhere. What it really takes to be successful is to pull. But the cycle for all that is so long that you kind of forget. So you go to Silicon Valley, and um, literally that happens in three months. Because your people who fund the person with the great new app or whatever it is, they, they have this thing, you may have heard of it, pivot or persevere, persevere or pivot. And your VC is gonna come in and talk to you, and, and they might like your idea, they might not like your idea. If they don't like your idea, they're done. If they do like your idea, they fund you. But they fund you for a couple of weeks. And one of the first things you gotta do is go out and talk to customers and come back with, Yes, I have already tested that, whatever it is. And they may believe you, they may not believe you, right? But now you've got two weeks to write a first beta version of whatever it is, and go out and try it. And they have this concept of a, a minimally viable product. You may have heard of this, MVP. MVP used to be most valuable player. Okay, now MVP is minimally <laughs> viable product. Kind of the opposite <laughs> thought process. <laughs> but the, and, and, and in jet engines, minimally viable products don't work. I'm pretty sure in diesels. <laughs> you really try to avoid those. You know, not, not, not a bad idea. <laughs> but, but in the software, so the, but this is how they run their stuff. And they get that long loop and that valley of death, all that glory or pain happen in a month. And in three months, you're, you're done. And so mm -hmm. your, your successful company comes from basically nowhere in about six or nine months. And then when they hit scale, right, and IPO and off to the stars, that's when you hear about them. The really interesting thing is to go hear about the people who are in the first three and six months. And, and I would submit that um, you can't translate that model for the reasons we said them. But there's a kind of a, a thought process that goes into this is not just about 
science and manufacturing scale and so on. This is ultimately about business model. And what is the right way, and I think that's why advanced research labs and universities, you know, are very understandably struggle. Because in the software world, I think you can push something, because you learn, or you die, or you pivot, or you do whatever in three months. And it's three people in a garage, or somebody's living room, or Starbucks. Whereas for us, it's a lot of money. And so I think if you really, if a university really wanted to get product out, it would need um, marketing, it would need voice of customer, it would need sales, and it would look like a company, which may not be the right thing to do. Well, yes, certainly a lot of the discussions about university industry partnerships, um, one of the first things people jump on are the different time scales, the, that um, companies, most companies, We'll, we'll talk about need to show quarterly profits. You've got to be showing. You've got to be. You've got to be demonstrating success. Whereas universities live on the time scale of time to PhD, which you know, four, four or five years. Um, you know, stable funding to to keep PhD students um, well fed and and thriving. And you know, I, the aerospace industry is is actually one of the few places where I've seen where you know you guys talk about six years, seven years, eight years, and we're going. That's great. That's our time scale. Um, but it, in some sense, that, that that's one of the questions about the Silicon Valley. Um, the the difference between it is because the time scales. You know, what what is you know what what is the role of the time scale yeah, no, in I that? Think, and the capital investment is is right. totally there. I, mean, I think it's a. But for me, it, it, it's the if I'm going to fail, let me learn quickly. Because otherwise, I have and this slow motion failure. And that's the Silicon Valley principle through right. and through. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and not to say that if, if it takes 30 days for a chemical reaction to occur, it takes 30 days for a chemical reaction to occur. You can't do it in 30 hours, right? But there's a kind of a mindset that goes with that that mm -hmm. I think it's good to just get into a different industry once in a while. And you know, how, would, how could we look more like that? So we ask ourselves, in the development process, is there a minimally viable thing? Does this thing have to have all the bells and whistles on it for me to isolate that one life-limiting feature? It's not going to go on a product, mm -hmm. but if it's this coding or that whatever, is there some highly accelerated life, you know, and you get into the weeds a little bit. But I, I'm very struck by the fact that uh, when we, and we did it in a very systematic way, the company brought in all kinds of people from on serial entrepreneurs, et cetera, et cetera. Most of their series were failures. Maybe the only success was coming and getting a check from us. But it was very interesting to listen to them. There are books on this stuff. Well, we talk a bit about the um, architecture for innovation, that there's some parts of the engine that take a long time to develop, and there are other parts that you could turn more quickly. And what we've done historically is we have captured the fast cycle time stuff and forced it to march along with the slow cycle time stuff. Uh, and so, you know, there, the question is, can you start to decompose the architecture, create a product architecture that lets you innovate more quickly on things that the customer will perceive as value while the basic structure of the platform is evolving more slowly? Interesting. Rex, do you have a question, Rex? Um, you know, one of the, the issues that, that comes up all the way, always in the context of returning manufacturing to the U.S. is um, you know, the, the, the skill of the workforce. And uh, our colleague from Lilly isn't here, but the, pharmace, the pharmaceutical industry is typical of that. They're, they're saying, well, our manufacturing systems, um, you know, are, are getting more and more sophisticated, and we want people that have a higher level of skill. Yet, you know, the culture in the U.S. is that, you know, parents preferably would want, want their, their, their child to go and get a four-year degree in English rather than a two-year degree as a, you know, a, a, an operator where their earning power is probably a 2x of the English graduate. But culturally, we have this bias against it. And you know, companies such as yours, you talk about requiring that workforce. Well, what can you do to kind of help change that attitude? It just occurs to me that one thing you could do is drive them through the parking lot at our manufacturing plant, let them look at the cars that are parked there, and then drive them over to the school and let them look at the cars that are parked out there. You know, um, I guess two things. We had a plant in Romania, and every operator was a four-year degree holder. Just observation. But I think um, 
I, I don't know, you know, parent of three kids, probably none of which are going to STEM fields, so, you know, abject failure right in front of you. So who am I to give advice? But I think um, <clears throat> a, a question to ask is we don't need all of them, but we do need training programs for the ones we pick. So in our composite space, um, we, uh, we actually in our composite fan blade plant, we're, we're at, we've been at it long enough now that we can take people literally off the street, we screen them, and in about three months we can train them to lay up what look like rags into a 47 pound blade that it itself will make 5,000 pounds of thrust and be on the front end of one of those big engines. And that's about a three month trip that we pretty much do ourselves. And they are FAA certified and all that good stuff, right? In, C in the um, high temperature composite space, we're piloting a program with the community college system near our plant in Asheville, North Carolina. And they will go through and, and learn PMC. We don't want to teach them CMC in a, it's effectively a public institution. We don't want to teach other people how to do our stuff. But um, I think that's what it will take. So, so I don't know what to do about the English and the this and the that. But the people who do want to go into manufacturing, um, I'm somewhat unconvinced that the people that the programs are going to train them for what we need in the future. So Boeing's got big training programs. I'm sure you've got, uh, you know, training programs. You, as you fill out, you know, I mean, not just different kind of manufacturing, but now it's got to be this whole marriage of digital and, and physical. It's a whole other set of training. So I think there's a, you don't need PhDs, but you certainly <clears throat> need something that I think will be appealing to parents, particularly when the kid comes home after the four-year college degree. I think, I think part of the issue, too, is this whole image that manufacturing has in the United States. And we've been talking about this amongst the subgroups of the AMP 2.0 initiative. And, you know, the, the country's going to have to step up, in my opinion, to do a national branding campaign for manufacturing. It's not dumb, dark, and dirty anymore. And, but we've got to get, get that message out better because a lot of parents still think it is. So, you know, they, we see these great commercials all the time for the Air Force and the Marines and the Navy. I mean, they're phenomenal commercials. They're really well done. And they always target that special audience that, you know, the, the, the guys watching football games, et cetera, you know, the girls watching football games as well now, right? But, we, hey, we, we, we could do the same thing for manufacturing. GE has done a great job, you know, in, in, in advertising about manufacturing. Some of the commercials have been phenomenal. Uh, but I think the country could get behind that and, and have some national branding campaigns for manufacturing. Like the one you're just starting up, could uh, put that as part of your budget. Yeah. Ali. I have a question about the role of universities in innovation and manufacturing. We always make things at the very smallest scale in our labs. We really don't know what are the problems for the scale up. And the kind of things we do at the, at the company are usually too sensitive. You know where are the bottlenecks. These are not the kind of things you want to tell outside people. So in some other industries, for example, in IC manufacturers, they set up this type of uh, platform areas or assembly places where they test something that is too far out, it is pretty competitive, and then researchers will find out what are the problems that you have an impact in the scale of production. How much do you think that is could be done in other industries in terms of identifying what are the manufacturing bottlenecks and where the universities that's an interesting question. I mean, you really hit me when you're asking. I, I wonder if GE actually faces this more than Cummins does. A lot of what we're doing is forgings, castings, and uh, the manufacturing technology, even in fuel systems, it's very small components working, in, and we've worked with national labs to develop manufacturing technologies, but it's still pretty traditional stuff compared to some of the composites and other things that you're working with where I can imagine you get into scale up issues more than you do if you're doing forgings and yeah. casting. I mean, I mean, to your point, you you don't know until you really try it. I mean, it's very much a jigsaw puzzle of, of MRL, TRL cost capacity, right? The problems you solve at this scale are, are different from the ones you solve. And then when you want trying to make 300 parts a day, not one, it's yet another set of problems. And we live that life. Um, but I think there are ways, to, and to your other point, the chip industry sets up, the, actually there's one in um, the Albany, New York area set up by SUNY, and then up the road towards Saratoga, there's a four or five billion dollar chip fab, and who would have thought that someone put a four or five billion dollar chip fab, you know, 
within the last few years in, in you know, Saratoga County, New York. I mean, it was the last thing in your mind, right? But that's exactly what happened. And in the university thing, there's a lot of companies in there and they do, I'm not familiar with the industry, but they do presumably the kind of thing you talk about. Um, in our case, you know, we will uh, divide the problem into parts. So I was actually met a gentleman in the back who is working with our teams um, on machining of CMCs, which is a hard problem because CMCs are actually machine tool materials. So how do I machine machine tool material, right? So it's not a trivial uh, problem. So there's a, there's a particular case. Another kind of an example is additive. So we accelerated our um, entry into the additive space by an acquisition. So sometimes you can do it, you know, uh, inorganically. And it's not that they've got the complete answer, but they were way down the track compared to where GE is, and now they're part of the, of the GE family. But, I, but, but, you know, you guys may have better ideas, and we but need those. I think that's ideas. one of the purposes of these institutes, though. I mean, the, the institutes are supposed to get these companies together. The, you know, the, the research is supposed to be industry-driven. So if the, if the companies that are joining these institutes and putting up all this money aren't willing to share their sensitive manufacturing problems so that the researchers from the universities can work on it, then we're failing. So I, I truly believe that this, this institute model that's being developed is supposed to attack that very issue. It will one, be a challenge. one of the things that we've done, I think, pretty effectively over time is develop these cooperative research and development agreements in labs typically funded by DOE and uh, setting up funding structure uh, where you're clear about the IP ownership going in, and that's one thing that, and in fact, I spent a fair amount of time negotiating an agreement like that with Purdue some years ago. So we got an overarching IP agreement with Purdue so that when Cummins is working and funding work here, the researchers, it's not just a separate negotiation every single time, but you understand yeah. the framework that you're working on. Yeah. We have a question in the back. Uh, well, uh, most of the, uh, a lot of you guys are from one side of the industry, and I'm from the other side, so I have a small business that's under a million in sales. And when you guys talk about training and, you know, with the budgets that you have, you're able to put these systems in place. Um, to gentlemen in the center there primarily, I do believe, uh, do, you, do you envision being able to articulate systems down to the level of the small manufacturer the training needs on their floors and the inter interface to the university resources that will bring uh, needed uh, technology or uh, consistency of technology change on that manufacturing floor. Absolutely, uh, and, and we, we, we're already starting that. So even prior to uh, conducting any of these project calls for the research agenda, we're already meeting with small medium manufacturers and talking about what issues they have so that when we, we begin to roll out that, that curriculum content working with our university partners, we want to focus a lot of the effort for the small medium manufacturers. It's a big part of the initiative of these institutes. If we don't do it, we're failing. And I'm quite confident that the membership's going to hold us to it. Yeah, I should have been clear when I was talking about the Cummins partnerships. There, it's general education. It is not for Cummins employees or people who are going to become Cummins employees. So the Advanced Manufacturing Institute that we've set up down in Columbus that actually has some funding from Lilly is broadly it's set up to be a regional facility for large and small businesses as well. So we, it, we really, we never set up a training place or a partnership like that in a community where it's just for Cummins. But typically in the communities where we operate, we have enough clout locally with uh, sort of political and being and funding sources that we can help uh, sort of as be a nucleus for it. And, and, and I would comment that um, one of the starting points for INMAC was actually a series of listening sessions around the state, mainly talking to small, medium-sized manufacturers to talk about workforce needs and the, the, the really aggressive working on building a partnership with Ivy Tech, with the regional campuses, with Vincennes has, has been to try to make sure that there's a, a, a very, you know, sort of close to the ground level um, doing something that's useful. Yeah, so. I mean, one, you know, one of my research interests is the, you know, the actual individual need of the worker yeah. and the training modification, tra training tailoring to the individual worker. And, you know, that's a constantly continually improving environment that just never stops. It mm -hmm. just evolves on a continual basis, so on day to day sometimes. And just, you know, that the robust environment that is going to be required for that. Enrico. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Sudali's point. Um, one of the things that makes or break an industry is uh, reproducibility. 
And uh, indeed, whereas we cannot be a university, you know, uh, farms to make hundreds of widgets, I think one element that we need to uh, work together is uh, even on the single technology that we develop, to have a protocol or a way to address, you know, the reproducibility of that process, that material, and that should be an integral part, I think, of, uh, you know, our education as well as our goals in becoming a better manufacturing site in the Midwest. There's a, you know, we sort of gravitate toward technical and training and all that stuff. There's another element that um, Cummins has been involved in over the years for uh, making the Midwest more successful in manufacturing, and it is the whole idea of being welcoming communities. You know, there are diversity is an important uh, element of being successful anywhere, mm -hmm. and um, some of the laws that are occasionally proposed here and some of the public reactions aren't the warmest for uh, those who are not, uh, let's say, conforming to the, at least the local norm. Uh, so I, I think that, that as we're thinking about all the things we can do specifically in the Midwest, one part of it I think has got to be social. And let the record show that was a mechanical engineer. That said. Okay. <laughs> Anyone from HR? <laughs> Any, uh, last questions? Who wants the privilege? Okay, then I will simply wrap up by, once again, I'd like to thank all of our speakers and our panelists, and I hope you'll join me um, for really. And, and I'm going to do two more thank yous um, to my colleague, Byron Pipes, um, MC of the day. And, and last, to Christy Smith in the back, who made all of this work, and if, if any of you communicated with anyone, it was with Christy. <laughs> there are refreshments, reception outside, so I hope you'll stay and have some more conversation, and thank you very much to all of you for being with us today.